Hello, this is David Wilcock, and you're seeing Wisdom Teachings. This is my new program here on Gaim TV. I am so excited to be here today. Every Monday, you're going to see a whole new program, half an hour, of the Wisdom Teachings from ancient mystery school traditions, world religion, and many of the most amazing spiritual traditions that we can muster together, giving you practical tools that you can use today to help make your life better, to help get a job, to help sort out your relationships, practical things that will really improve the quality of your life. My focus in this program is to bring you the information that can set you free. Because I believe that we have been lied to, I believe that there are truths that have been hidden from us, and the only way we can really transform this planet and get the world that we all deserve is to have the truth. One of the things I'm so excited about why I'm doing this with Guy and TV is there is absolutely no censorship on this show. I can literally talk about anything that I want. Illuminati, political conspiracies, you name it. Anything goes. And another thing that is really innovative and novel about this particular program is that we are going to be listening to you. You determine what this show is going to be about. Every week you will have an opportunity to send in your emails and let me know what questions you have. What do you want this show to be about? We will then select the emails that we want to do those episodes about and we will contact you. At that point, you will film yourself asking the question. We will then use your video footage, if it is selected, in the show. So you will see yourself asking me a question, and then I will answer that question. And in this way, we're not coming down on a hierarchical level saying, this is what we want the show to be about. You determine the content. You determine the show. Guy MTV is $9.99 a month, and you will gain access to thousands and thousands of different unique titles that have exclusive streaming rights for internet distribution only on Guy TV. I looked at the catalog, I've seen the scope, the breadth of the information that is here, and it is stunning. There's weekly programs like Beyond Belief with George Norrie, which I've already appeared on. That's not the Coast to Coast AM radio show, that's a totally different animal. A full talk show with unique guests every week, and you're going to be seeing me every week talking about these amazing concepts. So I want to set the stage for you. I want to explain a little more about what we're going to be doing here and why it's so significant. In order to do that, we have to break down the mythology of science. Because believe me when I say that science is a religion. Atheism is a religion. With the same fervor of religious fundamentalists, skeptics steadfastly deny the truth evidence that is very solid proving that there is more to being alive than the physical human body. In fact, I will argue in this show week by week that we live in a organic universe. The universe itself makes biological life. And what's even more interesting is that we have to redefine life as being fundamentally energetic in nature. It begins as an energetic form, and biological life is only a precipitation of that deeper underlying energetic core. Biological life is written into the background of quantum mechanics. The actual laws of physics are tailor-made for an energetic form of life to arise. DNA itself is a quantum product. There is a wave in quantum physics that takes ordinary, what we would consider to be non-living atoms and molecules, puts them together in the shape of the DNA. In these first two half-hour episodes, this one and then part two, that will be coming next week, I am going to go through with you the scientific proof of how this works. 
the knowledge was found originally in my book, Source Field Investigations. When I'm talking about the source field, I'm talking about the idea that space, time, energy, matter, and biology are created by a universal consciousness. The book, of course, Source Field Investigations, made it to the New York Times bestseller list for three weeks, peaking at number 16. So people are paying attention. There's over a thousand academic references in this book that reveal an incredible mystery. The underlying unity of the universe. The universe is alive. The universe is a living organism. And we can get into, and we will get into, the idea of oneness. This is a more esoteric concept. It's a little harder to prove this, although we do have some methods I'll get into. But the real core of wisdom teachings, of what we're here for, why you're going to want to see this show with me every Monday, is that we are all one. The universe is a loving being. And ultimately, we have gone into a great experiment of separation. We have gone away from who we really are. But we never really lost it. We have ultimately the illusion of space, the illusion of time, the illusion of matter, the illusion of energy, the illusion of biology. But in certain mystery school teachings, such as the Law of One Material, a modern encyclopedia of wisdom, we find out that in the beginning there was only intelligent infinity, this awareness, if you will. But actually the Law of One Material, which we'll discuss much more in future episodes, says that infinity itself had to become aware, and that was the first step of the universe. Once infinity became aware, you would think that this would be a wonderful thing. But after what we could consider to be a certain given period of time, this awareness got bored. The boredom set in. The universe needed expression. It needed diversity. It needed action and life and spontaneity and new things happening. So at that point, we have a universe that is intelligent, that is alive, that is conscious, that decides to divide itself. And that division created what we now think of as planes of existence or dimensions. In the law of one material, they're not called dimensions, they're called densities. Densities are planes of existence that correspond to the chakras in the human body. Our body apparently represents a microcosm of this universal oneness that we are. So you have red chakra, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet going up through the traditional system of chakras. In the Law of One material, we are told that each of these chakras has a certain level of reality that it's connected to. Those are called densities and they're also called rays. Another really important point that I want to set up here right at the beginning is that each density has its own form of photons. There's first density photons, second density photons, third density photons, and now here on Earth, we're beginning to have fourth density photons coming in. Apparently since the year 1936, this was also given to us in the Law of One material. Fourth density photons are very interesting because those are the photons that allow thoughts to become things. That has not been happening to the degree that it is now any time prior to that point. Apparently, cancer is the result of thoughts becoming things. The rise of Nazi Germany was the result of thoughts becoming things. These things start to happen in 1936. We see the dawning of many positive changes, and we also see the rise of totalitarian governments and a great deal of corruption. So both aspects are at play in our society today. First density, second density, third density are all visible to us. That's another very important point I want to say right off the rip. First density would be the elements, earth, air, fire, water. We can see these things around us. We see the rocks. We see water. We see fire. 
we see Earth. Second density, however, is where things start to get a little more interesting. Because second density apparently begins on the level of the photon. A photon is merely a piece of light that moves through space at 186,000 miles per second. Second density photons, however, carry a cipher. They carry a code that will take first density material and transform it into biological life. Biological life starts on a photonic level in this teaching. Now the only reason why I would go this way right off the rip is because we have the scientific proof and I'm going to show you that in just a minute here. Second density photons can make anything from microbes to plants all the way up through every type of life except conscious human life. Those are all categorized in the law of one material as second density life forms. What happens when you transition into third density is that you gain self-awareness. Second density life has a sort of group consciousness. It's much like the idea of the hive or the school of fish or the flock of birds where there is some degree of complementarity in their thinking. We can see Rupert Sheldrake, for example, has done incredible studies showing that these groups of animals actually do carry some sort of awareness amongst themselves. That's why they want to travel in packs. There is a singular consciousness that they share. And that consciousness has instinct of self-preservation. There are birds who will crouch in the presence of the predator that they've never seen before. You can separate them from their mother, but they automatically know who their predators are right from birth. So there's an intrinsic download that they get. Much in the same way we go over to third density, we now have self-awareness. And in the law of one teaching, there are third density photons. You could actually bombard a second density life form with third density photons, meaning light that has the information in the light that will make human life. And that life will actually evolve into human life. This energetic bombardment occurs on a galactic level, on a celestial level, and on an interplanetary level. One of the new things that we're going to have to adapt to as we get this science under our belt is that it is a living universe. And that means the galaxy is alive. That means the sun is alive. That means the planets are alive. We can go through the solar system and look at the influences of the planets. There was a scientist named Michel Gacquelin French scientist who beginning in 1947 went through a tremendous amount of research looking at birth charts and seeing that different planets did in fact appear in certain auspicious locations for people of given professions. The one that he's the most known for is the Mars effect which occurs with athletes and military personnel. What we see is that when this particular planet, in this case Mars, is either rising, meaning it's on the horizon point, or has culminated, meaning that it's at the midheaven or directly overhead, that those planetary positions appear in those birth charts. Those people who end up as athletes or military personnel have those planets in those particular auspicious locations. So there is a scientific rationale for astrology. We also see the Russian scientist Tijevsky, who went through a whole huge amount of data, 2,500 years of research into over 30 different countries, showing that they were, in fact, being influenced by the sunspots. When sunspot activity peaks, so too do we get the most noteworthy events in that society peaking as well. The amount of energy that we have, the amount of excitement that we have, is directly correlated to the level of sunspot activity. Tijevsky was actually thrown in a Soviet gulag because he dared to suggest that the Russian Revolution of 1917 was triggered by this change in sunspot activity. It didn't change the fact that it was true. So in our modern world, we are coming into contact now with new science that heavily validates many of the ancient wisdom teachings. 
The wisdom teachings told us that the positions of the planets determined our level of consciousness and our focus. We will also see throughout the course of this program that there are much greater levels of astrology than the ones that most people see in their natal chart. There are ages of the zodiac, 2,160 years in length. And if you take each age of the zodiac and you add them all together, 12 out of 2,160 years each, you get 25,920 years. That is actually an Earth cycle called the precession of the equinoxes. It means that as you look at the night sky on the equinox, there will be a drifting of the positions of the stars by one degree every 72 years. That means that if you were to build a temple and try to align it with the stars, you're not going to get results unless you actually are only willing to calibrate for a certain length of time. It's not going to work. After 72 years, you're one degree off. That's just an unfortunate reality that they have to deal with, but it allowed the ancients to calibrate when those monuments were actually built because you can dial back in time and see the alignment. One of the most controversial subjects in ancient mystery school and ancient mysteries in general teachings is the idea that the Great Pyramid was built to immortalize an alignment that happens to be over 11,000 years ago. It's only at that time that the Great Pyramid and then the other two pyramids nearby match up perfectly with the positions of the stars in the belt of the constellation Orion. At the same time, we see the Nile River perfectly in alignment with the Milky Way galaxy. So this is just the beginning of another big subject that we might talk about. It all depends on your questions. What do you want to hear about? Which is ancient mystery school teachings and how far back do they really go? We see pyramids and stoneworks all over the world. There's over 130 of them in Egypt. There's an estimated 300 to 500 pyramids in Mesoamerica. There's a tiny island in the Philippines called Bohol that has 1,776 mounds, each of which are 50 meters tall, which is basically the same height as all the Mesoamerican pyramids. And yet today, the official government of Bohol can't even get it together enough to build one hotel on the island. It's still under construction, because I wanted to fly out there and see this for myself. How could the tiny island of people get motivated to build a 50 meter pyramid even a hundred times. The amount of earth they would have to move around is crazy. But then to do it 1,776 times? How do these people consistently levitate blocks of stone that can weigh 100 tons? It's not easy to do. If it was easy to do, we would see the Maoris in New Zealand having done it before the English colonists arrived. We would have seen the Aborigines doing it in Australia. They're not doing it. We would have seen the people in Mesoamerica taking care of these things, building pyramids easily, because if they inherited the technology and it was easy, everybody should still be doing it. The Native Americans should have been doing it, but they weren't. There was something going on back in the old days that we lost. Now, I want to share with you some interesting information now. I want to talk about how this ancient mystery school tradition ended up getting contorted and turned to the negative. Because what we see in today's world is a global adversary. I wrote an entire investigation about this called Financial Tyranny. Financial Tyranny is focused on defeating the greatest cover-up of all time. What is this cover-up? What is this secret? What is the Financial Tyranny that I'm talking about? I am suggesting that there is what we could call the Cabal or the Illuminati. That term raises people's hackles on the back of their neck. Oh, I don't want to talk about that. If these people really do exist, we need to talk about them. We can't allow secrecy to fester because secrecy isn't doing you any good. It isn't doing me any good because the simple fact is that we had in 2011 Ron Paul audit the Federal Reserve. He worked with Congressman Bernie Sanders and a couple other guys and they forced the Federal Reserve, who are the outsourced bankers for the United States dollar. The U.S. outsourced the issuance of its own currency to a cabal of foreign bankers. This should be of interest to us because how do we know 
whether they have our best interests in mind. They have secrecy. Well, it wasn't until almost 100 years later that the secrecy finally broke and that we tore the lid off and looked inside at the squiggling creatures. And the squiggling creatures were bad because we found out that they had printed $26 trillion of American money and distributed it to these foreign Federal Reserve banks. $26 trillion? What? Are you kidding me? Yes, it's true. Congressman Bernie Sanders is out there on the internet describing $26 trillion in bailouts. They hid it in various terms. They called it a currency swap or this, that, or the other. But the point is, this is real. That much money, think about the crumbling infrastructure of our nation. Think about the fact that the average American citizen has less than $2,500 saved in the bank. If you were to take that money and redistribute it back into infrastructure, guess what? You could solve world hunger for barely more than a billion dollars, completely get rid of it. Not even a trillion, but a billion with a B, okay? You can solve many of the greatest problems that we have in our society. It doesn't take anywhere near as much money as we might think. There are practical solutions that can give people clean water, sanitation, and health. Now, if you talk to people in the cabal, they will say that they're concerned about overpopulation. There's a population bomb. And if they allow people to reproduce, then, oh, we're going to have this terrible problem, and there's not going to be room for anybody on Earth. We're all going to be eaten to death. OK, look, I have studied this data, and I also know that there are plenty of studies that contradict that prevailing viewpoint that these guys have. The reality is that once a given society is allowed to develop, the population growth stabilizes and in many cases turns into zero population growth or even negative population growth. People are having so many children because of the financial adversity. Their children are being born so that they have the hope of surviving when they get older because their children are dying of preventable diseases like malaria and dysentery. Just giving children shoes to wear, something as simple as that, can massively decrease the likelihood of disease and infant mortality. So when you start to look at the facts, you see that, in fact, we do have practical ways to stabilize the population without having to create mass atrocities, without having to create wars, and yet the people running the show behind the scenes have felt that this was the only way that they could ensure our survival. There is a mystery school tradition at the highest levels, and that mystery school tradition ultimately is Luciferian in nature. Whoa, what does that mean, Luciferian? It's as bad as you think, because these folks went through all the ancient mystery school traditions and believed that Lucifer was the common denominator which I do not ascribe to, but they actually see that Lucifer has a masculine and feminine aspect, which in Egyptian mythology would be Osiris and Isis, and then Horus being their child would represent the Trinity, the Luciferian Trinity. These cabal members actually put in the Washington Monument, which is the obelisk, the severed phallus of Osiris, and the Statue of Liberty, which is the female aspect of Lucifer. The crown off the top of the head, the light bringer, the torch representing the mystery school tradition, the sacred fire of antiquities is called. And of course, she's got the book. What's the book? The book is the mystery school teachings. So this all got started based on a very ancient misunderstanding. The law of one material teaches us that the Atlantean teachings originally were positive, but that the people of that era lost touch with who they really are lost touch with their core. And by losing touch with their core, the teachings which were originally positive were gradually contorted and moved over to the negative. So my goal is to restore what we lost. I believe that once we restore what we lost, we can heal our planet from many of the great problems that we face. I want to talk about what actually happened here with the financial tyranny investigation because 
In uh, the January 2013 year, in that month of January 2013, we saw Russian national television run with the ball and actually promote the material that I put in the financial tyranny investigation. This was stunning because what we saw was the revelation that the cabal had systematically confiscated gold from all over the world come out on a mainstream national television network. This is the exact copy of the order, the executive order that was filed in 1933 where U.S. gold ownership was confiscated. We see the president at the time saying that you are forbidden to hold gold in your own bank account. And the penalty, as you see here on the bottom, $10,000 fine or 10 years in prison or both. So they weren't playing around. And what they did is they confiscated everybody's gold. It's only now that this is finally coming out there and seeing the truth. And on the same day that this show aired on Russian national television, January 16th, 2013, Yours Truly was featured in a documentary that was out there and on that same day, Germany asks for their gold back from the Federal Reserve. It's the first time that anybody has done that in the history of the confiscation of gold out of the Federal Reserve. They wanted 3,700 metric tons of gold back and they wanted their gold back from France as well. When you consider the implications of what this means, and where this is going, <clears throat> the implications are that we have the power now to take back control of our planet. The wisdom teachings that I'm going to be sharing with you here are very important because they reveal what we need to know to break the stranglehold on science that the cabal has created. The cabal has, in fact, manicured scientific knowledge. They have taken away the truth of the non-local mind, the truth of what I call the source field. They have systematically weeded out the information that you have through controlling things like scientific peer review, through controlling the mainstream media. I focus on the scientists themselves, the hard data. So we're ending this first episode of the show, and what I want to end with is a hopeful message for you. I'm talking about the practical solutions that can transform your life. Because knowing about this does not have to create fear. It does not have to create paranoia or panic. It can create a loving flourishing of your life. Because you can work within the world that we have today and begin to master the problems that come up. So I want to see those emails. I want to see those comments in our discussion forum here at Guyam TV. This is an exclusive benefit of Guyam TV membership. As a member, by paying $9.99 a month, write in your questions. If I pick your question, then we'll use your video that you send us, put it in the show, so we can get this dialogue going. Because I want to talk to you, and I want you to talk to me. I want to find out what you're concerned with. I want to find out what you're passionate about, and I want to give you the practical instruction I used to do spiritual consultations. I used to give people psychic readings. I want this to be your psychic reading. I want you to be looking forward to this show every Monday because we're going to do this together. We're going to work through the issues that the world presents us with. I'm going to present you with practical solutions. I'm going to give you the tools that you need to energize your life, to live a spiritually awake life, to manifest the promise of the wisdom teachings in your daily reality, which is that you are one with the universe. There is only one of us here. There is only identity. So we will share this journey together. I will be your friend as we go through this, and I'm really looking forward to getting started. So thank you for being here this week. Tune in next week, and we're going to talk about the source field, non-local mind, energetic DNA activation, and how that biological universe is influencing you in your everyday life. I'm David Wilcock. This is Wisdom Teachings. Thank you so much for being here, and God bless you.
you are here with me, David Wilcock, for another episode of Wisdom Teachings. I am very excited about this week's episode because we are going to go through the living universe, information from science that has been carefully sequestered away, hiding the truth of who we really are and what we're really doing here on Earth. Of course, this is Gaim TV, and I want to again remind you that this is $9.99 a month. It's an incredible resource. There's thousands of unique videos you can't get anywhere else. Almost everybody who's anybody in this field that I work in, there's video content here. You can tune in every week on Monday and see my show, half an hour a week. And we listen to your feedback. This is your program. You tell us what you want the show to be about. Send me an email, send me a comment on your Gaim TV subscription page, and we will read those emails. And then if you get selected, we will have you videotape your question, and we'll use those videos in the show. So everybody who sees the show is going to see you, and we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can so that we're not telling you what this show is. We're giving you the opportunity to ask interactively and use modern technology in a way that I don't really see too many shows doing right now. The surface level of the world that we live in is an atheistic society. Science is supposed to be the ultimate arbiter of truth. And science continually reinforces the idea that you're born once, you live once, and you die once. And that's it. Could it really be that there is something more than one life to live? Could it really be that you have an existence that is much more fantastic and wonderful than what you have been told? If that's true, then maybe there is a reason for you being here on Earth. Maybe your life has a purpose. I believe that you are worthy. I believe that you are worthy of every kindness and every gesture of love that people have given you. And I believe that any time someone doesn't show you the love that you deserve, that you can confidently reject their opinion as not being useful to you on your path. Why do I say that with so much confidence? Because we have the science. Today I'm going to talk to you about the science that can set you free. The science that can change your life and transform misery into happiness. That is the core of the wisdom teachings. The wisdom teachings have been given to us in many cases by people who have gone beyond the level of evolution that humans on earth at this time now possess. They are often called ascended beings, or extraterrestrials, or angels. I absolutely believe they exist. The evidence is incontrovertible. I have already been in over seven episodes on Ancient Aliens on History Channel. There was another one about Einstein that I was in recently, and I was just taped for several more. We'll see how many of them actually get in the show. The point is, the evidence for ancient astronauts coming to the planet and giving us knowledge is overwhelming. And there is an incredible consistency in what they had to say. Only now we are piecing together the mystery and reclaiming the lost ancient inheritance. I want to share with you the science that cannot be denied. The science that ultimately proves that humans must exist all over the galaxy. How could there even be science like this? It's a perfectly good question to ask. If you want to understand life, you have to understand DNA. Because DNA carries the code for all biological life. You can take one cell, one single DNA molecule, and carry enough information from it to clone an entire organism. Therefore, DNA is the key to life. I have no problem with that. And I ultimately have constructed 
an elaborate new view of science. It's not the primary focus of this show, but I do want to talk about it from time to time. A science of the source field. The source field is my name for the unified field of consciousness that ultimately shows us that space, time, energy, matter, and even biological life are all created by a universal consciousness. That's a fascinating concept because ultimately what it does is it gives us a living universe. It reveals that the universe itself is not this dead artifact of gas and dust and hot balls of molten lava or nuclear fusion floating out there in an empty, thinkless void, cold, dead, and alone. A living universe means that even the energy of the universe, energy like gravity, electromagnetic energy, light, is alive. The core of the Mystery School teachings that I ascribe the greatest significance to would be coming out of the Law of One material. This appeared in 1981, and it was essentially a revealed teaching, meaning that it was spoken by someone who was completely unconscious. She was being asked, her name was Carla Ruckert, she was being asked questions by a PhD physicist named Dr. Don Elkins. The dialogue between Dr. Don Elkins and the source in the Law of One material is a fascinating study. There's five books. I came in contact with them in 1996, and it completely changed my life. Now, again, it's not like you have to say, well, I believe in this because this particular channeling said that it's true. <laughs> what I'm saying is that this material gave us scientific proof, evidence that either is right or wrong. If I tell you that something is true, and you go out and look it up, and you find solid scientific evidence that proves that what I said is right, then what you've done is you've verified a statement that I made. What I'm telling you is that there are hundreds of verifiable statements in the law of one material that we could go back and find the research for. Space itself is alive. That's a crazy concept, right? Even crazier would be the idea that time is alive. And yet, in my book, the Source Field Investigations, which was a New York Times bestseller for three weeks, peaking at number 16 on the chart. We have the evidence to show that time can be controlled by the human consciousness. There is an example of a study that was done in China with people having EHF, or extraordinarily high functioning. One person with EHF was able to teleport objects right through the wall. The object would literally disappear, it would, it would fade out, and then fade in somewhere else. You wouldn't think this is possible, but China has a huge population, and because of that massive population, the government was able to look around and find people who had very unusual capabilities. So what we see is that they took a little beeper device, and this beeps at a certain frequency, which means a speed. That beep is a steady, steady beep. It's just going to keep on going. And what happened was that as the person started to teleport the device and it started to fade out, the beep got slower and slower until it stopped. And then as the device starts to rematerialize on the other side, it goes faster and faster until it goes right back up to the normal speed that it was before. Time itself, as measured by this clock rate of the beeper, changed as an object dematerialized and rematerialized. This is incredible science. Why are we not hearing about this? Why does the media not talk about the Russian psychic Nina Kalagina, who was able to telekinetically move objects with her mind? Or Ala Vinogradova, another Russian, who was able to do the same thing and they measured electromagnetic fields around the devices she was teleporting or moving, and those electromagnetic fields matched up with her heart rate, with her respiratory rate, and even with her neurological activity in the brain waves. So look, this science is out there. 
the prevailing skeptical view is, oh, there's no evidence, or if there is evidence, it's all easily debunked. Granted, it seems pretty outrageous that somebody could move an object with their mind. You have to rewrite the laws of science if that's actually true. <clears throat> but what I'm telling you is that we have lots of scientific evidence that's user-friendly. It doesn't take a lot of work to get there. And this is the core of the wisdom teachings. Remember, the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because once you know this, it breaks down the conditioning that has been built into our society that will lead you to suffer needlessly. You don't need to suffer. You don't need to be in pain. You don't need to worry and be in fear because once you understand that the universe is built for a spiritual reason, that your life has purpose, that there is a destiny that we are all here to fulfill, you don't need to live your life in terror anymore. And once you understand that this is a divine creation, that this universe was built for you, you can change the way that you have responded to the things in your life that hurt your feelings, that caused you to feel pain. So let's get started with this new science. The non-local mind is what I'd like to begin with in this episode. I want to talk specifically about the idea that thoughts may be operating much like satellite television signals. Simply put, when you have a thought in your mind, most scientists would try to tell you that that thought is the result of neurochemical activity in the brain, electrical impulses jumping across synapses. That is definitely part of thinking. It's definitely true that you can get brain damage and your thoughts will be affected. However, there are cases of people having near-death experiences in which they are clinically dead. In order for you to legally qualify as clinically dead, three things have to happen. Full cessation of heartbeat, full cessation of breathing, and full cessation of brainwave activity. That means there is no electrical activity whatsoever happening in the synapses of your brain. It shuts down. Brain dead is supposed to mean you're a goner. But people have been resuscitated from brain death, and upon their return to the body, they accurately report what's going on in the operating room. Dr. Pim van Lommel from the Netherlands has done a comprehensive investigation of many different scientific studies into near-death experience and concluded absolutely that this is true. There are commonalities of what people experience as they go through this process. Many people have, in fact, seen the conversations happening in the operating room, brought back very specific pieces of information, things that they said, things that might have been sarcastic, things that might have been a little off color, very specific data points that are brought back from the grave. But I'm going to take it way beyond near-death experience because there are scientific studies in the lab that actually prove what's going on, actually prove that your mind is connected in internet-wise with other minds. There is an internet, if you will. The internet is almost like a stepping stone to the telepathic reality that links us together. As you think thoughts, your mind is sending out waves of energy that can be directly felt and actually translated by others. Radio waves work the same way. If you were a kid in the 1950s or 1960s, or if you were a science geek like me that read a lot of those books from the 1950s and loved to mix vinegar and baking soda together and watch effervescence happen, the bubbles that form, I was into all that stuff. And I was really into the idea of the crystal radio. Crystal radio is a little rock, and you tighten a screw against the side of the rock, and that determines the compression of the crystals inside, which is how you tune the radio station. Now, how's that possible? There is a process going on inside that crystal called piezoelectricity. The crystal itself is actually vibrating. It's changing its molecular structure. It's doing this little push-pull thing as electromagnetic waves are moving through. 
electromagnetic waves move the crystal and the crystal vibrates with the waves and then depending on the width of the crystal determines which stations you'll pick up. So as you tighten the screw, you're actually changing the station. Consciousness could be working exactly the same way. There is a gland in the center of the brain called the pineal gland. People who have been following my work for a long time know that I'm all about the pineal gland. In this gland, there is floating water, a reservoir of water, with crystals that actually have piezoelectric properties. So there again, we have the opportunity for signals to be found, for the crystal itself to vibrate, and then there's also another thing called piezoluminescence. If you have a little lighter and you hit the lighter and then you get that little spark that comes out, that's from a crystal being compressed. And as the crystal is compressed, it releases photons. In your brain, you have these little floating crystals that actually have that quality. And even better than that is there is another characteristic called piezochromatism. Piezochromatic crystals are crystals that can release any color of light in the rainbow as they are being vibrated. So you could have full spectrum light. If you ever needed to create full spectrum video projection on a quantum level, you would need piezochromatic crystals to do it. You'd need crystals that you can con control their tightness or looseness with electromagnetic fields and you get all the different colors that you need coming out of that electromagnetic process. Dimethyltryptamine is the main chemical that seems to do this. When DMT is chipped out of a tray that it was synthesized in, you hit it with a screwdriver, bam, you get these big bursts of colored light. Big burst of red, big burst of green, big burst of yellow, big burst of blue. Well, you have these little crystals floating in your brain. They exist naturally in certain types of food, and the pineal gland, based on the research that's been conducted, is the most likely area of the body to synthesize DMT. So there is a whole pineal gland model, and that's another thing that we'll talk about throughout the show. But I do conclude that the pineal gland can pick up information non-locally. How does this happen? The pineal gland is lined on the inside with tissue called pinealocytes. These pinealocytes are similar to the rods and cones in the retina of your eye. That's right, it's the third eye. Your brain has a third eye in the center, and it has retinal tissue. It also has the same wiring as your physical eyes do to the visual cortex in your brain. It's called a phototransduction cascade. So you have the physiological organ in the body that was called by the ancients the third eye, but it was only in the 1990s that we discovered the retinal tissue and the phototransduction cascade. How did they know that all the way back then? That would imply very advanced technology that would have been required for them to gain such incredible information about the brain. And yet they did. And so think about what that means. If you have little crystals that can vibrate and release all the colors of the rainbow, and people claim when they go out of body or have a near-death experience that they see a silver cord. There is a cord linking their astral body to their physical body, and photons can pass in either direction. Ultimately, this is just the beginning of the wisdom teachings around consciousness. But I want to dial it way down for a minute and talk about some very simple things that can be proven. The multiples effect is one of the most fascinating pieces of consciousness science that we see. The multiples effect literally refers to scientific discoveries being made simultaneously. Somebody files a patent for a particular invention. Somebody else files a patent for the same invention at the same time. This sounds pretty crazy. This sounds like a disturbingly real coincidence that's probably not a coincidence. And what you may not realize is that this was documented to happen 148 times just by 1922 alone. 
Now those are only the cases where people actually patented it and debuted their invention nearly simultaneously. How are they doing that? It would suggest that there is an information exchange that we're going through. That when you think about a problem, the solution is already being broadcast. What you solve in your mind is going out there into the universe. So let's look at some practical examples of this. Calculus, that mathematical model, was discovered simultaneously by more than one person. It's very complicated. And yet, as you're working on a problem in your mind, you're broadcasting it out there. That's the implication, that there's a biasing mechanism. And bear in mind, I'm only telling you one piece of science. There's hundreds of pieces of science like this. And in the book, Source Field Investigations, we have over 1,000 academic references. So if a skeptic is going to be there and, mm, yeah, 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 there's a prosaic explanation for this, the weight of science is overwhelming. It collapses the resistance. So let's just have fun with this for a while and be willing to be open-minded enough to see that this might be true. Because if this is true, we're only building a foundation that's going to go through the ceiling here. The implications of this information is that you are part of a living universe that has an agenda. And I want to give you those wisdom teachings, but in order to do that, I need to break down the conditioning that has kept you locked in this prison of material thinking. The theory of evolution wasn't just Charles Darwin. Others came out with the same idea at the same time. Decimal fractions, another complex form of mathematics. The discovery of the oxygen molecule. The discovery of the principle to make color photographs happen. Logarithms, sunspots, the law of conservation of energy. These things are all being thought about by people and they broadcast that knowledge out into the universe and as we think about it, other people solve it. Six different people simultaneously invented the thermometer. You have mercury inside a glass tube. The temperature of the mercury makes it rise or fall inside this little glass cylinder. Six different people at the same time? Come on. You've got to start to really open your mind here. Nine different people invented the telescope at the same time. That's not an easy thing to do. You take a long tube, you have to file down lenses of glass with extreme precision, get them optically pure, and then figure out how to line them up so that you can actually look out there in space. Nine different people came up with that at the same time. Multiple people got the idea to invent the typewriter at the same time. Again, very complicated. Buttons that go to little levers that have to all go towards the center so that they're hitting the same spot. You have to arrange them sort of like a little stadium, a little arena. That's not easy to think up. Multiple people came up with the typewriter, and five different people invented the steamboat at the same time. Steamboat, again, you've got to have a big water wheel in the back. You've got to have a steam engine. It's something that logically arose out of other technologies that existed, but the point is it was invented simultaneously. Now, I want to talk about the most important one of all. I'm going to cut right through lots and lots of scientific red tape here, and I want to get back to the meditation effect, because the meditation effect shows the power that you have in your consciousness. The way that you think, the way that you feel is like voting. It's voting for a reality. And the reality that you're voting for, if you live in fear and in pain, is a fearful and painful reality. One of the biggest wisdom teachings that I've learned, this is a very important point I want to take on as an aside here, is that you attract what you focus on. Yeah, it's been called the law of attraction. I'm sure you've heard it before. But do you really pay attention to that? Have you figured out that if you don't love yourself, that people who don't love you will be attracted into your life? Many of the fundamentalist religious teachings would have you believe that all you have to do is buy into their dogma, get saved, and all of your spiritual work is, is completed. But what we find out is that everybody is integrated. Everybody is unified. If you detest your brothers and sisters, guess what? You're going to be balanced with karma. 
Jesus of Nazareth taught about karma. As you sow, so shall you reap. The whole word that is in the Bible that is used to represent hellfire and damnation is Gehenna. The word Gehenna refers to the garbage dump outside of town where they burned all the things that were impure, like corpses and garbage. The burning itself is what he was referring to. The word Gehenna was mistranslated. Karma is actually what hell refers to, and it's not eternal either. That word was also mistranslated. The word that is used to mean eternal is aeon, which became eon. It's A-I-O-N. And Gehenna is spelled G-E-H-E-N-N-A. So the eternal hellfire, it only represents a cycle, a given period of time that you go through Gehenna, which is actually the purifying fire. It's burning off your karma. But the principle of hell works a lot better if you're the Roman Empire trying to seize control of people and get them to pay you tithes so that your taxes for the government are people literally being afraid that if they don't pay tax, that they're going to be burning in hell for all eternity. Separation of church and state didn't happen until the Reformation. So this meditation effect shows us that you can't condemn somebody else to hell. You can't say that if somebody doesn't believe your way that they don't matter because here's what we find out. We find out that when 7,000 people get together, only 7,000 people and meditate, that terrorism and fatalities and war worldwide decrease by 72%. Just take a moment to drink that in for a minute. 7,000 people under one roof, meditating, blissing out, feeling good, have an effect on free will around the world to such an extent that three out of four people who would have picked up that gun, who would have tried to shoot somebody to create a fatality, they decide not to do it. Do you think that maybe, just maybe, the thoughts that people have on this earth affect your thoughts? Do you think that maybe, just maybe, if you are participating in the solution, that you can affect real change? If you want to participate in the solution, the wisdom teachings say that you need to be in a state of blissful, loving consciousness. The wisdom teachings say that by experiencing pure consciousness, you can rise your own level of evolution. You can become part of the universal mind. So take a moment with me right now. Let's breathe that consciousness in. Use the power of your breath. And as you fill your lungs with that purifying, healing air, you are also breathing a living organism because the universe is alive. As you use and harness the power of your breath, as you get into that blissful space, you are changing the fabric of reality. You are making it so that people don't have to be hungry, that people don't have to be killed, people you'll never see, people you'll never meet, because we are all unified in a field of consciousness. We're together here on this planet, breathing the same air and thinking with the same source field. The scientific discoveries that one person is making will affect how you think. The compassion that you have in your heart will allow others to become more compassionate. So what I'd like to leave you with today is this idea. Meditate on the peace that is within each moment. Meditate on the love that is present. And you will begin attracting loving thoughts into your life. I want to see those comments. I want to see those emails. I'm David Wilcock. This is Wisdom Teachings. Thank you so much for being here. And God bless you.
All right, this is Wisdom Teachings with David Wilcock. Welcome to another amazing episode. We have such an incredible show for you today. I'm going to attempt in half an hour to get through an astonishing body of information. I want to bear in mind that this is a ground setting operation. What we're doing is getting you the knowledge scientifically that is needed to break down the conditioning. We're doing this here with Gaim TV. There's thousands of unique self-improvement titles where the streaming rights for the internet are only available through Gaim TV. For $9.99 a month, you participate in a subscriber pool in which you see my show every Monday. You see Beyond Belief with George Norrie every week. There's other weekly shows as well. And you send in your emails. Tell me about the personal problems you're going through. The first six episodes we're taping before those emails come in. But when you send us your emails and tell us what you're interested in, certain people will be selected to be videotaped. You'll tape yourself, send it in to us, and you will appear on my show right here on this screen. And you'll ask me the question, and then I'll answer it for you. The subject that this show is really about is wisdom teachings. That's the deep esoteric knowledge that has been passed down to us through religions, through mystery schools, and even through modern mystical traditions. The underlying core of this material is the concept that the universe itself is a living organism. To me, that's a very exciting notion because it gets rid of this Aristotelian idea that we are simply dead and there's nothing else out there but us in the universe. We're taking away that materialistic bias that science has had in it ever since its dawning. We're bringing back in the ancient tradition that says that we are part of a living, conscious universe. And for me, that's where it all starts. So I want to talk to you today about some of the principles of science that will help set us free from the materialistic conditioning that we have been subjected to. I do believe that there are forces out there in our governments and even those that control the governments that don't want us to have this information. There has been a concerted effort to hide from the mainstream scientific breakthroughs that would lead us in the direction of a universal consciousness paradigm a way of looking at the universe that is fundamentally conscious in nature. So the basic principle that I have is that we are living in a source field. The source field is the principle that space, time, matter, energy, and biological life are part of a universal consciousness. That in fact the universe itself is alive, that it has created life, for the purpose of expressing itself. The consciousness of the universe is your consciousness, you see. We are interconnected, and what we think in our own minds is not a private thought. The way to look at this is to see that all aspects of our reality are fundamentally interconnected. My book, The Source Field Investigations, probes into the scientific research that proves this. I've actually seen some people on Amazon.com say that the references are dubious. This is not true. You can go check them yourself in the ebook. There's over 1,000 academic references. And if these references are dubious, then that means that the whole nature of science itself is dubious. What we're saying is that certain scientific discoveries are overlooked. If they're ever mentioned at all, they're only mentioned by themselves, and no one has taken the bits and pieces and put them together and come up with a unified paradigm, a unified model of how all of this fits together. In our previous episode, I spoke about the meditation effect. This is very, very significant, because what it shows is that everyone on Earth is part of a unified consciousness. So the religious ideas of fundamentalism that say that certain groups are the chosen and other groups are the damned, or that we don't have to care about what happens to people who are not part of God's chosen, this is ridiculous. It turns out that we're all sharing the same mind. So how could you have any desire for other people to suffer if their suffering is going to affect your consciousness? Well, check this out. 
a small group of people, only 7,000 people, got together and meditated. In their meditation, they're just thinking about bliss. They have a state, a term for the state that they go into called pure consciousness. Pure consciousness has been described by various saints and sages, including St. Francis of Assisi, where the sages will say, a single moment of pure consciousness is worth more for God, for the world, and for humanity than an entire lifetime of good works. Meaning you could go to the soup kitchen every day of your life, you could donate books to the library, whatever it is that you want to do for charity, and a single moment of truly hitting the state of pure consciousness is more important than all of that. Now, what happened when these 7,000 people got together and tried to hit that state of pure consciousness? Bear in mind, too, that these 7,000 people were not totally on. Somebody would have an itch, somebody would be bored, they wouldn't really be meditating, but they were trying. It's just that it, it's not like these people are perfected. 7,000 people together doing their best caused a 72% reduction in worldwide terrorism. 72% is approximately three quarters, right? 75 would be three quarters. That's pretty darn close. So think about what I'm telling you here. Think about the fact that you have these effects going on worldwide where three out of four people do not choose to pick up a gun and fire that shot that's going to hurt someone or even kill someone. The terrorist acts are, of course, very nasty things that people are doing. But what we're seeing is that this single group of people, 7,000 people, have that much of an effect. It's really astonishing. Something is going on here, something that we need to know about, because what it reveals is that this science cannot be denied. I want to bear in mind here that there's 50 different studies of the meditation effect that have been conducted. It has been verified. It has been published in social psychology journals. They ruled out all variables, weekends, weather, holidays, anything else that could possibly have caused this. It is definitely due to the people meditating. That's it. Nothing else. So. I want to take it out to the cosmic level now. I want to really expand the scope here and talk about the work of Dr. James Spottiswood. Now, what was he doing? Dr. James Spottiswood was looking into what he called anomalous cognition. Anomalous cognition is another word for ESP. Now, he was doing a meta-analysis. What does that mean? That means that he was combining multiple scientific studies, over 20 years worth of scientific studies into anomalous cognition from all over the world. Now these were people who were ordinary, these were not trained psychics, they didn't have any special ability. Each of these studies was totally scientific, peer-reviewed, published in mainstream journals with ordinary people, totally scientifically sound. Now, what was he looking for? Why would he want to combine 20 years' worth of these studies together? What, what would you even do with all that information? Well, what he did was he was looking for a particular effect. He wanted to see if people were going to be more psychic at a certain time of the day. So you could say this is kind of like an astrology thing. If the sun is directly overhead, it's high noon, is there some sort of energetic influence? that's going to come down, beam into your consciousness somehow, and make you more psychic. Now, skeptics are going to say, oh, well, the whole th psychic thing is ridiculous, so why would you even bother to do this study? Well, Dr. James Spottiswood knew enough about consciousness science to understand that in many cases there is something to this consciousness. It's not just locked up in your own brain. Consciousness is much like satellite TV. When you think thoughts, you're broadcasting information out into the cosmos. So what he had to do is look at all these scores over 20 years of time, standardize the scores together. So he's actually finding a commonality in the way that people's testing shows up. In other words, 
he sees how psychic somebody is in one test, and he tries to get a unified scale, so it's like 1 through 10, let's say, and a 10 is the most, and the, and the 1 is the least psychic, and you standardize that out across all these 20 years' worth of studies. Everybody gets lined up, everything's perfectly calibrated, and then he's got to look at when in the day people's psychic ability seems to be peaking. That's how he had to crunch the numbers. You can imagine this is an exhaustive amount of research to do. Because each of these studies, they might have hundreds and hundreds of people who are being tested to see how psychic they are. And the tests involved things like remote viewing, Gonsfeld, which is where they put these half of ping pong balls on your eyes, and you float in a flotation tank with a lot of salt in the water. And then you basically go into an isolation state, and then they start running you through psychic tests. Another one is Zener cards. You might have ever seen these in some movies like I think Polter, not Poltergeist, but uh, Ghostbusters I think had the Zener cards in it where there's a circle, there's a star, there's wavy lines, there's a square, and you have to guess which of these five cards they're picking. So people would be scored on that. There's another one in which you drop balls down through this series of pins and you try to control which slot the balls land in at the bottom. Okay, these are a lot of different clinical studies into ESP that have been done, or anomalous cognition. Is there a standard way that people become more psychic during the day? Unfortunately, nothing could be found. There was no observable time period in a typical synodic day. Synodic means the Earth revolving around the sun. No time that made any difference. It didn't matter if it was sunrise, it didn't matter if the sun was right overhead, it didn't matter if it was the sun right below you on the bottom in the middle of the night, even though probably most tests were not conducted that way, unless it was a sleep study, there were dreaming studies in this as well. But now check this out. There was an effect that came out when he looked at the sidereal day. Now, what is a sidereal day? A sidereal day, this is interesting now, a sidereal day is measured by the Earth's position relative to the center of the galaxy, not the sun. Okay, that's a little strange. That's not something most of us are used to thinking about. But if the sun is going around the galaxy, right, as you're orbiting, we're orbiting the sun, but the sun is revolving around the galactic center. So it turns out that each day it changes by four minutes. You're going to have a four minute difference per day in terms of where the center of the galaxy is. Okay, that's interesting because if the center of the galaxy has some kind of energetic influence, you can't just say that at a certain time of the day, like, okay, it's 1230 now, now I'm aligned with the center of the galaxy. It doesn't work that way. It's going to drift four minutes a day, and it's going to drift over the course of the whole entire year. So you have to calculate this. Now, there are websites where you can calculate local sidereal time, or LST, not to be confused with the ubiquitous LSD25. This is totally different than that. LST, local sidereal time, it will trip you out, but in a whole different way, and it's totally legal, and it's not going to fry your brain. Because as it turns out, this is what we get. This is the actual graph. Now look at what we're seeing. This is standardized over 20 years worth of data. That is the time, not for the local synodic day, right, which is, remember, the Earth around the sun. This is the local sidereal day. All you got to do is bump it ahead by four minutes, and you chunk those out into even intervals, and you say, hey, that's my day, and you graph it out over 20 years. This is what happened. Look at the peak here. Do you see? This is the, the time of local sidereal. We go down to 13 hours, which is basically a little bit after high noon, where the galactic center is right aimed at you. The galactic center is directly overhead, high noon, right? Bam, look at this. It goes up by 400%. 400%? How could that even be possible? Are you meaning to tell me? Dr. Spottiswood, that people have a 400% higher performance on their psychic ability? 
just based on their position with the center of the galaxy? There is no precedent in science whatsoever to suggest that something like this could even happen, or how it would happen, or why it would happen. We just don't know. We throw our hands up in disbelief. The galaxy is supposed to be just this big chunk of stuff that's out there on its own doing nothing. Doesn't matter where we are, doesn't matter what position we're in, we're just floating around in space doing our thing. And the galaxy has no effect on that. But 13 and a half hours local sidereal time, if you try to meditate, if you try to give yourself a tarot card reading, let's say, if you try to get a psychic reading from somebody who is a professional psychic, they're going to be 400% more accurate. You're going to get a better reading if you can time it out with this 13 and a half hours. Now, what is the explanation here? What could possibly be causing something like this? My idea, which is backed up scientifically, is that the center of the galaxy is a source of energy. And when you are aligned with the center of the galaxy, as you're standing here on Earth, and your position lines up with the center of the galaxy, there is literally a beam of energy that is streaming into you. And you could liken this to the frequency of the energy that you're thinking with. Now, what am I saying there? What frequency? What is he talking about? Mm -hmm. Okay, now hang on. Have you ever done this? Have you ever put a pan on the stove? Let's say it's a cast iron skillet, right? You heat it up. If, and you want to test to see if you're ready to start making pancakes. So the first thing you do is you drop a little water in the middle of the skillet, but you haven't hardly even heated it yet. What does the water drop do? It just sits there. But then when, it, when the skillet gets hot and you throw a little drop of water in there, what's going to happen? It's going to do this. So temperature is actually the speed that molecules are vibrating. As it gets red hot, the molecules inside are vibrating faster and faster now. How does this relate to consciousness? OK. What if the energy of your mind is actually not just the synaptical connections that's going on inside your brain? What if you have an energy body, let's say? What if part of your cognitive process is the result of the speed that energy is moving in your energy field? And what if there were cosmic factors that could increase the speed that the energy is flowing? What if, when we're in alignment with the center of the galaxy, is your position on Earth, the Earth is rotating like this, there's the center of the galaxy, let's say, right? So here you go, and boom, as you come in here, it's like I've got a hair dryer now, and you feel the blast of the hot air. That temperature, that heat, is an increase in the speed that energy moves through your mind. And it's just like upgrading a processor on a computer. If you have a weaker processor, let's say you got a 200, mega, or 200 uh, megahertz, let's say, right? Then what you're going to have is, that was a computer I got back in like, what, 1998. I had a 200 megahertz. Slow. You couldn't even run the internet on it now with the YouTube videos and everything else. Nowadays, the computer will have 2.4 gigahertz, 2.6 gigahertz. That's a lot more because a gigahertz is 1,000 megahertz. So when you upgrade your processor on your computer, you're happy because now programs load faster, your computer isn't going to crash, things are going to work much better. This exactly duplicates what we're seeing here. This graph shows us that the galactic center is actually upgrading the frequency, the speed, of your thoughts. It's like your whole energy body gets a lift. That's really fascinating. The next thing I want, to I want to talk about here is how this concept that I just gave you can map into the cosmos as a whole. I have just given you a very valuable piece of information. I gave you the meditation effect and I gave you the galactic effect. I'm showing you that you are not disconnected from the reality around you. You are interconnected with your universe. The things that are happening around you in the universe are connected to you. I have spoken in previous episodes of this show about the concept that biology is 
a product of an intelligent universe. Biology is not local to the Earth. It's not like some random mixture of things only happened once on this planet due to an explosion of soup, this primordial soup. Biology is, in fact, a universal phenomenon. And we can show that. So check this out. We're going to talk about how life is an emergent phenomenon of quantum mechanics. Whoa, quantum mechanics? Quantum mechanics is supposed to be equations and dull, dry, boring stuff, not the alchemy of life. But wait a minute, hear me out here, because we have some very fascinating studies that have been done. The one that I think really takes the cake is the DNA phantom effect. The DNA phantom effect was discovered in 1984 by Dr. Peter Garyaev and Vladimir Poponin. Now, what are we talking about here? He takes a quartz container and ultimately he's putting DNA inside the container. But before he puts DNA in the container, he just puts it in the room by itself. And when he does that and he zaps light into the room, photons appear all throughout the quartz. So there's nothing strange about this. It's very simple. You have a room, you're beaming light into the room, you measure where the light goes. This is on such a tiny level that every photon shows up as a dot on the graph. Are you with me so far? OK, good. Every photon shows up as an individual dot. And when the light goes into the room, you see lots of dots. OK? When you put DNA in the room, it absorbs all of the light into itself. It acts like a black hole. Now, black holes are the only things in the universe we've ever seen that can bend light as it's moving around. In fact, there's something called gravitational lensing, which validated Einstein's model. You look at certain stars, and you see that if they are directly behind a black hole, they'll bend around the black hole's gravity, and you'll actually see four apparent stars, because that's the lensing effect. Now, that's supposed to happen only on a macrocosmic level, but we're seeing that DNA on a microcosmic level is doing the same thing. This is really strange. Imagine right now if I was the DNA molecule, right? And there's all these lights around me in the studio so that you can see both sides of my face. There's a shadow here or here if I do this. Imagine that I'm absorbing every photon in the room. The room goes completely dark, and now I'm glowing. And that's all that you can see, because every photon in the room is bending into my body. That's what happened in this study. Every photon is absorbed into the DNA. Let's take a look here. What you see at the top, each one of these dots, as I said, is an individual photon. And then down here, look at this. You're seeing a squiggling line. This is the actual path that DNA takes as it moves the light into itself. So every little guy that was here is going whoop, 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 just sucking into the molecule. He duplicated this again and again. This doesn't go away. This wasn't a fluke. It wasn't a one-time thing. It's a basic, intrinsic property of DNA. This should have gone all over the world. We're talking about almost 30 years ago, 1984. What the heck happened? Well, it gets crazier than that because there's more to the story here. This was the setup that he had back in the day where you have the laser beam. That's what was providing the light that goes in. The collimator is a lens that focuses that light down into a, a small area. The cavette, as it's called, is the actual container that the DNA is stored in. Then we see the DNA is here. Another collimator widens the beam back up so that it can go into a photomultiplier tube, which then leads to a separate unit that counts the photons and then sends that information back to the computer. Okay, So it's pretty straightforward here. Now, we also want to point out that he was not the first to describe DNA absorbing photons. He caught it in process. Now, that's important. Gary Iov and Poponin, they caught this mechanism happening. They watched light go from being all over the room to popping into the DNA molecule. But they were not the first to find out that DNA does this. That goes all the way back to the 1970s. 
And you start thinking to yourself, my gosh, if this has been going on for that long, if people knew this, why is it not being taught in high schools? Why is it not even being taught for universities? Why are we not trying to use this technology for healing and health? Well, here's what I want to talk about before we end this episode. Dr. Fitzalbert Pop's study was on what causes cancer. That is the holy grail of medical research because right now, I remember looking on Daily Mail, a UK website, where they were saying, life-saving treatment denied to a dying girl by her mother, as if it was such a terrible thing. But the life-saving treatment was frickin' chemotherapy. Radiation, bombarding your body with this toxic stuff that kills everything that's there. Hoping that the cells that die off include the tumors, which are then dissolved and reabsorbed by the body. But of course, you're killing off good stuff as well. We're hitting cancer with a stone. We're throwing stones at people who have cancer and hoping that maybe they'll bleed it out. That's basically what chemo is. It doesn't need to be that way because he figured out what causes cancer. He looked at every type of carcinogen, everything that was out there, and he found there was one unified link. Now, nobody in the public domain has ever said that there was one commonality that makes things carcinogens, but he found it. They scramble light at 380 nanometer wavelengths. Well, what's that? That's ultraviolet. That's outside the visible spectrum by a little bit because the visible spectrum goes to 400. 380 is a little bit below that. Okay, what the heck is going on here? Why would that work? Well, he didn't really know, but the more he studied it, he said, okay, it seems like there's something going on with this 380 nanometer light. So, he eventually concluded that the cell might be using the light as a signal to itself to stop reproducing. The light is actually sending information through the body. The information that is being given tells your cells, hey, you guys are going out of control, you need to stop. And if you don't have that light in your DNA, then the cells don't know when to stop growing. The big discovery, he had a graduate student who didn't believe this, but he tasked the graduate student to build a photon counter that can count single photons of light. And what he found was that one DNA molecule, when you break it open with a chemical called ethidium bromide, has a thousand photons shoot out. So your DNA is literally storing photons inside of itself, much like a woodchuck would store acorns in a tree for the winter, or a squirrel, if you will. So this is really strange. We're looking at something very odd here, and we also see that when you are sick, light reduces in your cells. Now, what's going on here? How can we use this knowledge? That's what I want to end today's episode on, and we're going to pick this up next week. The light reduces in the cells that are sick. Your DNA is storing photons. So the questions we need to ask ourselves is how do we get the light into our DNA? How do we keep it in our DNA? And how do we make the best use of this knowledge? What I will propose is very simple. We're integrated on a collective level. That meditation effect I spoke about at the beginning, 7,000 people are meditating and everybody feels better. When you're aligned with the center of the galaxy, you're 400% more psychic. What I'm saying to you is that there are energetic causes that can beam in photons to your DNA. I will propose that your overall level of intelligence and what you're thinking with is the photons, not just what's in the brain. You have a light body that is very measurable because your DNA stores light. So right now with me, why don't you breathe a little bit? Let's take a moment to feel that flowing energy, to feel yourself breathing light into your cells because this is just the beginning. We're going to explore this system. We're going to learn about who we really are, our connection to the universe, the fact that we are not alone. This explains the placebo effect. You can breathe with me now and fill your DNA with light. Fill your cells with the healing power of the universe. Simply learning how this works can make your life better today. I'm David Wilcock, and I thank you for watching.
yeah, this is Wisdom Teaching with David Wilcock. Welcome to another episode. We are going deeper and deeper into the mysteries of the universe today. This is one of the ones that you're going to want to watch again and again because the core of the source field information is really going to be in this episode. The core of what it means to be alive in a biological body in a living universe. Because the universe itself is alive. This is not a popular idea. It's not something most people even ever thought about. But we have evidence, solid scientific evidence, that this is, in fact, what's really going on. I'm doing this show with Gaim TV. Since we have a little preview at the beginning that we're going to put out there on the internet, I want to mention Gaim. Gaim is a company that you might see when you go to Whole Foods. If you ever looked in the yoga section, you'll see a lot of different yoga products. You'll see yoga mats, yoga blocks, yoga wear, yoga everything. Gaim makes those products, and they've been in business for a long time. And this is Gaim TV. What's happened is that Gaim has systematically collected a huge body of titles out there of metaphysical, spiritual information, as well as, get this, over 50% of all the yoga titles of DVDs that have ever been made. They're out there for sale in the store. You could buy one DVD and pay a certain set price, or you get Gaim TV and you can watch all of them. So this is all under the umbrella of self-improvement, improving yourself and your body, improving your mind, improving your spirit. And it's all part of one continuous thing here. So if you see me on Gaim TV, that's only one of a variety of things. My show comes on every Monday. There's also Beyond Belief with George Norrie. There's other shows that come out every week. And there's also literally many thousands of titles. The library is being built all the time. So new stuff is continually being added. There's no end to what you can see. It's all high definition, streaming in real time. So you'll definitely have plenty to look at. I see it as sort of like the spiritual Netflix. And another thing that's cool is that even though this is a corporation that has an international presence, I have no censorship. I can literally talk about anything that I want. And I'm not going to try to get myself in trouble, but I'm also not going to hold back on the truth because you deserve the truth. You deserve to get the truth in a way that is not filtered, that isn't dumbed down to the lowest common denominator, where we are speaking to you as an adult. You deserve to know the reality of the universe that we live in. I don't want you to be lied to anymore, and I don't want to be lied to. And if people are lying to me, I'm going to find out. I'm going to look for the truth. I'm going to dig down. I'm going to do the hard work. I have spent 30 years putting this research together. The first book that I read was when I was like eight years old. So it's really more like 32 years. And some of that research made it into this book, The Source Field Investigations. So the source field, again, is the concept that space, time, energy, matter, and biological life is created by a sentient universe. The universe itself is alive. In our previous episode, I went through some of the data that's in this book, Source Field Investigations, which, as I said, has over 1,000 academic references. The bibliography is thick, and it's all this tiny, tiny type because we had so many references in this book. So I spoke about the meditation effect. And again, I'm going to not go into as much detail as I did before, but I just want to remind you that this changes everything. You can get 7,000 people put together under one roof. They meditate. They don't even all have to be very good at it. They're just trying their best. And three out of four people in the world who would have committed terrorism based on basic statistics don't commit terrorist acts. So you got some guy on the other side of the world living in an impoverished situation. He doesn't have windows. He doesn't have a carpeted floor. He doesn't have enough food. His children are crying. He's angry. He wants revenge against the great Satan. He's going to go out there and commit that act of terrorism, use an IED, an improvised explosive device, and blow some things up. Try to take out as many people as he can. Commit suicide. Three out of four of those guys, or anybody in the world who would do terrorism, doesn't do it. They feel better. They feel more happy. Something is going on to make these guys feel more happy, and it's being caused by people meditating, and not very many. This strongly suggests the universe is biased in favor of love and peace. 
Because if 7,000 people committing acts of murder, committing acts of fatalities and acts of aggression, if they could create mass hysteria in the world, we'd be in really bad trouble. Obviously, there's a lot more people than that praying for bad stuff to happen by the way they act. So the universe is biased towards the positive. And here's another interesting thing about this. The government could pay for this. Has there ever been any war strategy that gets a 72% reduction in terrorist activity? If you blow somebody up who you think is a terrorist, guess what? You're blowing up the whole wedding. You're blowing up mothers, daughters, sons, grandparents. Do you think they're going to just go back to bed and forget about the great Satan at that point? Heck no. You can fund people to meditate, and there is no military countermeasure that has ever been so effective. But guess what happens? The bloated national defense budget, it all just flows right out. You don't need to spend that much money anymore. You see how this could be a problem? You see how entrenched power structures might not want you to know that national defense actually involves national happiness? Think about it. If you get more happy, you're changing the world. We have the power. You don't have to wait for somebody to come and save you. If you don't like the way that the world is, you can change it. And we also spoke about another fascinating discovery by Dr. James Spottiswood. What you're seeing here is a combined graph of how psychic people are across 20 years of data. The data was on all different types of studies into ESP, Gonsfeld, which is flotation tank, Zener cards where you guess the symbol on a card. We had all kinds of stuff, remote viewing. And these studies were standardized by Dr. James Spottiswood, so everybody's psychic ability in every test was given a unified score, like 1 through 10. And then he wanted to see if they were psychic at a certain time of day. No regular cycle of the Earth around the sun made people more psychic, but our position on Earth relative to the center of the galaxy had a huge effect on how psychic we were over 20 years of time. These are ordinary people. Look at the graph here. There is a 400% increase in how psychic people are when your position on Earth is at galactic high noon. It's actually right at the strongest point here, right at about 13 hours and 30 minutes, or about 1.30 in the afternoon, galactic time. It shifts by four minutes a day, so if you want to try this out, you have to actually calculate it every day. You can do that online with a local sidereal time calculator, and you can Google that and you'll find it. S-I-D-E-R-E-A-L is the way you spell that. So where are we going with this? The last episode, I spoke about the work of Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, who was one of the scientists that found out originally in the 1970s that there is a component to human health, and specifically cancer, that is entirely based on light. This was a very fascinating discovery. He was looking for the holy grail, as I said, what makes a chemical cause cancer. And what he found was that every carcinogen scrambles light at an ultraviolet range, 380 nanometers. It's just above visible light. You can't see this because visible stops at 400 nanometers. This goes up to 380. But it's out there. As it goes higher and higher, as the wavelength gets higher, the actual distance of the wave gets less. So that's an important point. So what's going on here? It seems that light is being used by your DNA, that your DNA is storing light, and it shoots out a little signal that the light is being used to telegraph information. And it says to the cell, stop reproducing. Because all cancer is, is a cell that doesn't know when to stop reproducing. It just grows and grows and grows. So if this was known in the 1970s, then why the heck haven't we made any discoveries about how to treat cancer because of it? Maybe they don't want you to know. Now who's they? What's the only business on earth that makes more money than oil? Think about it. Pharmaceuticals. Do they make money if you get well? No. They only make money if you stay sick. What if the real basis of health is photonic? What if the amount of photons stored in your DNA is your level of health? 
That's what the research shows. That's what I disclosed in source field. That's the conditioning we have to break down to get you into these wisdom teachings, to ultimately lead back to the philosophy of how to keep the light in your body. Because psychological factors determine how much light your DNA stores. And I'm going to start proving that to you today in this episode. So check this out. When he broke open a DNA molecule with a chemical called ophidium bromide, the DNA cracks open. Then he had a photon counter that could measure the number of photons in the room. And what he found was that a thousand photons flew out of a DNA molecule when you break it open. A thousand photons? How many DNA molecules are there in the body? Do you know? Well, think about this. The body has a hundred trillion cells. Only 10% of the cells in your body are human. Did you know that? 90 trillion of the cells in your body are microorganisms that are not part of your own body, but they live in a homeostasis with your body. That leaves you with 10 trillion cells. Each cell has 46 chromosomes. Each chromosome has two chromatids. The chromatid is a DNA molecule. So you have a total of 92 DNA molecules in each cell, and that doesn't include mitochondrial DNA, which is a whole other category. 92 DNA molecules. Each one of them in each cell is storing 1,000 photons. And you have 10 trillion cells. That means you have 920 trillion DNA molecules in your body. And that totally doesn't include mitochondrial DNA, which could easily double the number. This is crazy. That's a lot of photons. You are a being of light. You are storing light for your health because Dr. Fritz Albert Pop found that when you're sick, the light reduces in that part of your body. The light actually goes down. Now, it turns out that there are ways in which this relates directly to the formation of light in the universe. This particular study that was published in 2008 talks about chemical coding of DNA. You take multiple different types of DNA, you give them a little chemical marker, like a color, and then you drop them in the water. That's literally how simple this experiment is. It's like tossing confetti at a wedding, and each piece of confetti is a different color. Well, the wedding party is going down, the confetti is falling through the air. You're not going to expect to see confetti coalescing on the way down and all the colors joining together as the confetti falls. But that's what happens when you put DNA in the water and you color code each type of DNA. The DNA will travel the equivalent of thousands of miles if it was the size of our human body to find each other and have a family reunion. Now, this was scientifically proven. This was a study that was out there in the mainstream. I just showed you where it was published. Now, if DNA can do that, if DNA is actually attracted to itself, the only forces that could explain this would either be something like an electrical force or gravity. We've been able to rule out electrical because electrical can't explain the DNA phantom effect that I talked about in our previous episode. DNA is the blueprint that makes the human body. The entire code to build a human being is in DNA. That's very important because what this science is ultimately going to tell us is that DNA is a blueprint in the quantum field itself. The quantum mechanics is not a bunch of arcane equations that terrify you to even try to understand them. It's a lot simpler than that because DNA is made out of a wave. It starts as a wave. The wave gathers physical materials together to make a DNA molecule. That's what we see in this study that I was just talking about. So the DNA phantom effect, as I talked about last time, was fascinating because we have a little room, and in this little room, we shoot light into the room. It's a tiny container of quartz. When the light is in the container and there's only empty space in there, you count these little dots, which are where the photons go. But when you put DNA in the room, this was discovered by Dr. Peter Garyev in 1984, 
and Vladimir Paponin. When you put DNA in the room, the light bends into the DNA. Now that cannot be explained electrically. It's a gravitational effect. That's the only known force field that could do something like this. DNA is hungry. It's absorbing light. And again, you have 920 trillion DNA molecules in your body, minimum. Pretty wild stuff here. But that wasn't the most intense part of the experiment. It's crazy enough to think about the idea that DNA could be absorbing photons in the room. If that was happening to you as you're watching this show right now, the entire room around you would be dark and every photon from every light would be going into you. But here's where it gets really strange. Dr. Garyev ended the experiment. He pulls the DNA out of the room, but right before he leaves the lab to turn off the light and go home for the evening, he decides to look through the microscope one last time. Now remember, the DNA is gone. He looks through the microscope and he sees something that should have been impossible and it is one of the most significant discoveries in the history of science and nobody talks about it. What do you think happened when he looked through? What do you think was happening to the light even though the DNA was gone? Well, if you think the light is in the DNA, right, and the DNA is responsible for holding the light, you pull the DNA out, you should see the light go with the DNA. You pull the DNA away, there's no more light in there. That's not what happened. What? Here's what actually happened. The light kept on spiraling where the DNA had been before. There's no molecule holding the light in place. Now remember how I spoke just a moment ago about DNA like confetti? You throw the DNA into this room and the DNA goes whoop and it all comes together, right? That's gravity doing that. There's gravitational attraction. There is a wave that comes before the DNA. It's like the old chicken and the egg, right? Which came first? The wave or the DNA? The answer is now evident that the wave comes first, that there are DNA forming waves and they're all around you. They're pulsing right now. You don't think about the fact that right now you've got cell phone waves, you've got broadband internet, you've got all these things competing for people's signals to tune them in on an antenna. What if your DNA is an antenna? What if what your DNA is tuning in is photons? And what if the amount of photons in your DNA determines your level of physical health? You see what a breakthrough this could potentially be? You see how in terms of health and fitness, if you do yoga, if you're doing cardiovascular exercise, that you're opening up potentially these waves to allow DNA to absorb photons. Because this can't be as simple as visible light. Visible light only hits the surface of your skin. There's DNA all the way through your body. The DNA on the surface of your skin is a very small percentage. So it can't just be that you shine a light on somebody and that's how they get all the light. I believe that these photons will actually go in when your DNA phantom opens up. But I want to talk about the DNA phantom some more because this gets crazy really fast. The rabbit hole gets really deep. Now check this out. The phantom remains where the DNA was. You see this ghost of photons, a thousand photons, and they're going at the speed of light. Zing, 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 zing. But there's nothing apparently there that could hold them in place. Here's what happens. This is the actual trace of all the photons in the DNA molecule when it's there by itself. Here is an up close, if you took this wave and you zoom in on it and you turn it a little bit sideways, there it is. All the photons are there where the DNA was in the double helix, but there's no DNA at all. This is really, really wild. What is causing this to happen? Well, we know the answer. We know that it's being caused by an energetic structure in gravity. Gravity has convolution. Gravity is the most misunderstood force. We don't even have a way to test for gravity waves right now. All we know is that gravity accelerates at 10 meters per second squared, which is the old science experiment. You might have gotten caught. Many people got caught on this in high school. If, you were, if you're in a total vacuum and you drop a feather and a stone, which one's going to hit the ground first? You'd think the stone, right? Because the feather, no, 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 no. If there's no air, 
The stone and the feather will drop simultaneously and hit the ground at the same time. That's gravitational acceleration, but there's this whole other part of gravity that we missed. So here's what he started to do. He blasted the DNA phantom with liquid nitrogen. This is super cold gas. The liquid nitrogen would make the photons run away. They would be freed from this force field that's holding them in place for approximately five to eight minutes. But then something seemingly impossible happened. New photons were captured and absorbed back into the phantom again after five to eight minutes. It kept returning. Now here's the next question. How long do you think this was going to last? 10 minutes? Half an hour? One hour? One day? Five days? 10 days? It's going to sound crazy, but remember, this was scientifically proven. I'm not making this up now. It lasts for an entire 30 days after the DNA is removed. So you're sitting there in that chair right now. I'm assuming you're sitting in a chair. Maybe you're lying down. It's not really good posture, but we'll, that's another episode. You're sitting there in that chair, I hope. And after you get up and leave, your whole body's got 920 trillion DNA molecules in it, right? Each one of them is doing this. You go off to the bathroom, you leave the house, but there is a ghost, a full 3D hologram of your body where you were sitting as you're watching my show. And it's still sitting there. And it's going to be there for a month. Now here's the trick. If you could make that room dark enough, you could actually see it. We actually do have the potential to create a room that is so light tight that we could catch this in process. That's a scientific experiment that I very much want to see. Hasn't been duplicated so far. Nobody's actually been able to do this, but we should eventually be able to get the technology where it's sensitive enough that that could be possible. But we do know that it's true because it's been observed in the lab. Your DNA, wherever you go, moving your arms, walking around, you're leaving behind this phantom. And it lasts for an incredible 30 days. So this really does prove that DNA is harnessing a non-electromagnetic energy source. So let's talk a little bit more about the implications of this. The implications are that gravity has a quantum spin. That gravity is not just something that makes things fall, but there's structure in it. And it's a structure that doesn't like to change that much. You move it into one position, and it's going to kind of stay that way. Now, how does all this relate to you as a soul? It suggests very strongly that your body is being influenced by that wave, that the wave that holds the light in place is essential for health. Now, check this out. If you, this, I found this, by the way, in a book called Life and Mind by Sava, S-A-V-V-A. If you take a human embryo, a fertilized egg, and you remove it from the womb, does it grow into a human being? No. Here's what happens. This is human embryogenesis. What we see is you take the fertilized zygote, you put it in a test tube, and no more than 80 cells of the embryo will grow before it goes into a stasis and it stops growing. No more than 80 cells. The baby doesn't know how to turn into a baby unless it has the information of the mother's womb. The embryo must be implanted into a uterus. You can keep those cells alive. They'll hang out. They'll wait. You can keep them in nutrient broth and they'll just keep on cooking. But they won't grow into a baby until you put them back into a uterus where they then get the information from the wave that they need to grow. So you see what's going on here? You see how this changes the definition of what life is and what the DNA molecule is? Because right now, there's this comfortable idea that the DNA molecule contains all the information to build the body. If you were to make, instead of a digital code, which is binary, which means 0 or 1, if you made 0, 1, 2, 3, so you have a four-digit digital code, the amount of information in one DNA molecule is only about 1.5 megabytes, which is a floppy disk. 
one of those old-fashioned three and a half inch floppy disks that you don't even see anymore because if you burn a CD-ROM you got 700 megabytes and we're not even using CD-ROMs we use a thumb drive which has gigabytes of storage the old-fashioned floppy if you just make a, a quaternary code instead of binary has all the information the DNA molecule so you're telling me that this little birthmark I got here on my forehead is inside that floppy disk? I don't believe it. I don't believe that floppy disk has all the information to make my brain with all the complexity of my brain or all the complexity of the whole body, all the systems that move, that make my hands move, make my body move. And look at the evidence here. The baby doesn't grow if it doesn't have the mother's information fields to allow it to grow. That's really fascinating. Because what that reveals to me is that there's something deeper going on when we pry off the lid of the secret nature of the universe. There's something out there that we don't really know about right now. There's new information. I want to talk a little bit about Budakovsky because he found something else that's really quite fascinating that shows us that no life is required. You only need the code. Check this out. He took a, a fragment of a raspberry plant and he made a hologram out of it. He took a holographic picture of a raspberry. He zaps that raspberry hologram into a tumor from another raspberry plant. Now, in case you don't already know what a tumor looks like, this is a raspberry tumor. It's big, it's gross, it's gooky. If you have one of these in your body, what is the doctor immediately going to tell you? Oh, we got to cut that out. That's bad cells. We can't use those cells. What if there was a way to reprogram cancer cells? What if you could actually take those cells and reprogram them to become useful cells? Well, guess what? If you shine the laser into the cells of the callus, which is a tumor, it develops into a healthy raspberry plant. Now, that's only something that has to be done by consciousness. You have the power to heal yourself. That's one of the wisdom teachings. Physician, heal thyself. Within you is the full body of medicine you need. Now, I'm not saying, like the Christ scientist people, that you want to deny treatment to somebody who desperately needs it, because you have to reach a certain level of adepthood in order to get to the point where this is going to work. But the point is that it does work. You can take these disgusting tumors and turn them into stem cells that become a healthy raspberry plant. And it's really quite fascinating. So there's vast practical and theoretical implications for this. The entire genetic code can be enfolded into a photon of light and stored holographically. You can get the photon information without any biological life and that photon now has the information to transform a cancer cell. Photons are huge. Planck's constant is the smallest thing, 10 to the minus 32 centimeters. That's where quantum energy moves in one burst at a time. Photons are like the size of a planet compared to that, so they're plenty big enough to have fractalized, encoded information in them. That's a very important point. There's lots of room for these fractal structures. This is what I call the digital biology model. Very important to know that DNA is written into the background of space and time. So you are a projection of divine source consciousness. You are the source field. You are the universe. And as you awaken to your true potential, you are discovering that you are not alone in the universe, that everything you need to heal yourself is within. So you can meditate with me right now, breathe in deeply, and become who you already are. This is Wisdom Teachings with David Wilcock. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week here on Gaim TV. Right. This is Wisdom Teachings with David Wilcock, and you are here today with me in the living universe, experiencing 
the dance of human life and what does it really mean to be a conscious being. Wisdom teachings are our key to give us practical knowledge that can change our lives today, bringing us more happiness, more fulfillment, more of the things that make our lives functional and productive and aware that the universe has an agenda. We are not here living these lives without any greater purpose or greater beingness. We are actually part of an integrated homeostasis. The universe is alive and how you think and how you treat others will have a direct bearing on what you experience. That's commonly called the law of attraction. It's a very normal principle when people get into self-improvement spirituality and that's what we here at Guy MTV are all about. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to work with Guy MTV because self-improvement videos are on this network. There's over 5,000 different titles just right now and that's growing all the time including 50% or more of all the yoga videos out there. There's a whole bunch of fitness videos. You can get into psychological healing. You can get into mysteries of the universe. And in this show, I'm going to try to cover a lot of different material. These first six episodes are really where we set the stage of the living universe. And I go through the source field material, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then from there, I want to branch out and have the show be co-created with you. So I would like you to send your emails. Everybody who's a subscriber to Guy MTV, you have a full access to all the videos, unlimited high definition streaming. And best of all, you can send us your questions. I will read them. We will choose the best questions and have you submit videos of yourself asking the question. And then you will be on the show if your video gets chosen. Try to keep it to less than a minute in length, and we'll put you on the show, and then I will answer your questions. So do you want to talk about government conspiracy, Illuminati? Do you want to talk about extraterrestrials, UFOs? Do you want to talk about what my insiders have told me about sometimes some guys have met over 200 types of human extraterrestrials? Do you want to talk about ways in which your life can be practically improved? Are you having problems in your relationship? Are you having problems with your boss? Are you having problems with your family? Are you trying to meditate and finding out that you're having trouble getting to the right level? Anything and everything that you might want to know about, the wisdom teachings incorporate all that stuff. And this forms an interactive show. We're using modern technology to bridge the gap so we can have a discussion here. Today's episode is going to still be setting the stage. As I said, there's a nucleus of the first six where we're going to set the stage to talk about philosophy. So you can always go back and watch these first six episodes to have a scientific foundation for the philosophical discussions that will follow. So again, our main body of data that this is all drawing off of is the idea of the source field. That term is what I coined it because everybody who discovers this, and there's been many scientists who have, they all give a different name for it. The source field is the concept that space, time, energy, matter, and biological life are all part of a universal consciousness. That means the matter that's around you, the matter that makes this set, the matter that makes me, it's all part of a conscious living universe. That's probably the biggest shift in human consciousness that we've ever had. It's bigger than the idea that the earth is round when we thought it was flat. It's bigger than the idea that the sun is in the center of the solar system when we used to think that the sun and all the planets were orbiting the earth. This is such a shift because right now we think life is this dense concentration that's all on earth and then everything out there is dead. And now what we're finding out is it's just the opposite. The universe is teeming with life. And not only that, but biological life is not the intrinsic nature of what life is really about. In conventional science, we say that life is the byproduct of the simple biological cells that make it up. Without cells, without their respiration, without uh, eliminations, 
without the ability to move around, you don't have life. That was the old definition. The new definition of life is that life begins energetically. And there's a lot of interesting things that I have in my book, The Source Field Investigations, that give us scientific validation for that. As I said, there's over a thousand academic references here, many of which are peer-reviewed from top scientists. Anybody who says otherwise is lying because you can go and check it for yourself on the ebook. Every reference is clickable. You can go back to the internet, read the original references, and find this out for yourself. So today, our focus is going to be on healing. I want to talk specifically about how the energy of the universe makes your DNA and then how that energy can be used for healing. We started to get into this in the last episode, but now I really want to focus on it and take you to an even deeper level. This paves the way not only for healing technology in which we can have energy medicine, but we can also take it into how your mind and your faith and your belief can heal you. And once you really understand this, once you're armed with scientific proof, you have the wisdom teachings in your hands. You have the knowledge of what the Hindus called prana, of what the Taoists called chi. And you can see how that knowledge can facilitate your own healing. So, we talked in one of the previous episodes about the DNA phantom effect. This is what we see if you have a, an empty room and you shine light into the room. Each one of these dots here is a photon. That's where the light would naturally go if you just shine light into a little bitty room and there's no DNA there. But when you put DNA in the room, look at this. Every single photon in the room is captured and absorbed into the DNA molecule. That's bizarre. That's not something that conventional science tells us should happen, but it does. And what was even stranger than that was that when you take the DNA out of the room, there's a phantom where the light continues to spiral in the same pattern even though the DNA is gone. That is really, really bizarre, but it's been scientifically proven. And what's strangest of all is the phantom lasts for a month. That means that if you're sitting there watching the show right now and you get up and go to the bathroom, you're going to have an energetic phantom that will last for a month where you were sitting. Now, that's not easy to think about because you're not used to this, but if you could get the room dark enough, your body would actually leave behind a glowing phantom. As I said last time, you have trillions of DNA molecules in your body. There's 10 trillion human cells, and there's 92 DNA molecules per cell minimum, not including mitochondrial DNA. So you have a minimum of 920 trillion DNA molecules, and Dr. Fritz Albert Pop discovered that there's 1,000 photons per DNA molecule. Wild. So you have an, a countless amount of photons, something like 9.2 quadrillion photons, or even more than that. I don't know. I've got to add up the numbers. I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head. But the point is that you could give off billions of photons just like that, and it wouldn't even amount to anything. So you have the ability to be sending these photons around. Now, this gets us back to the idea that if DNA can be formed out of a wave, right? Because the DNA is pulled out of the room, but the light is still being captured, that suggests that there is a wave that's holding that light in place, and it doesn't require the DNA molecule to be there. Think about it. The DNA molecule isn't necessary. There is a wave that may be taking atoms and molecules from its environment and spiraling them together to make the DNA out of what was formerly non-living material. So I want to talk today about how that knowledge can be used for healing. The code of the human body, the code of what it takes to make you could be around us right now, just like satellite TV signals, broadband internet, radio waves for AM and FM radio. It's all around us all the time. But what we don't usually see is that that potential can be used to make life out of non-living material 
and it can actually be used for healing. Healing in the conventional scientific view is something that's the result of getting enough oxygen, getting enough sunlight, getting enough nutrition, making sure you're properly hydrated, making sure that you breathe enough, making sure that you get the things that your body needs in terms of medicine, vitamins and minerals, nutrition, etc. But there is an energetic aspect to healing. And the energetic aspect may actually be as important or possibly even more important than all of the other things that we think are related to healing right now. And if you don't believe me, let's go through the scientific proof right now that will make the case. First of all, the same scientist, Dr. Peter Garayev, who came up with the DNA phantom effect, made a stunning discovery about how that DNA phantom, how that wave function of DNA can actually directly cause healing to occur. This is amazing. He took seeds that were killed by radioactivity from Chernobyl, the worst radiation disaster in modern times. It was a huge, huge problem. We're very fortunate that it wasn't any worse, actually. Now, you take one of these seeds from Chernobyl that was killed with radioactivity, and here's the trick. He treats the seeds energetically. Now, remember, these seeds are dead. It looks like a seed, but the information that makes up the DNA, the particles that made DNA, they're all scattered around. A DNA molecule is like a crystal. The crystal has to be in a certain structure. What we would consider to be death, clinical death, is where those crystals start to break apart and the molecules that make up the DNA start drifting off to the wrong place. What if there was a way to take those missing molecules that have gone to different places and start bringing them together and corralling them, much like you're herding sheep back into their little corral? This is what happens when you take laser light and shine it through healthy seeds and then beam that laser light from the healthy seeds into the seed that's destroyed. All he's doing here is beaming in that light and through no other means but just that there is a complete restoration. The dead seeds come back to life and are healthy and rejuvenated. Now, if you don't see the implications of what I'm telling you, then you're not paying enough attention. Because what I'm telling you is this was death. This is the boundary that should never be able to be come back from. That seed is toast. But think about it. If you have a wave function in the universe that can take non-living material, like hydrogen and oxygen molecules in water, let's say, or silicon in beach sand, and actually make life out of that, and we're kind of jumping ahead because that's next week's episode, but let's say you could do that. <clears throat> it's going to happen. Once we get that knowledge in place, we're seeing that, hey, a seed's got most of the ingredients it already needs to be alive. Most of the stuff that we need to make the seed is already there. It's just sort of like you've got to solve the jigsaw puzzle. The pieces aren't quite right. You beam in this energy, you beam in this light, it says, you over there, you're supposed to be here. You over there, you're supposed to be here. Now, okay, how does that work? I said that the DNA phantom effect is like gravity. You have a DNA molecule, and it's hungry for photons. You stick it in that little room, and the photons now are being bent into the DNA molecule. They would normally go wherever they want to go, but the DNA actually captures them. So think about the fact that when you look at a stream on the side of a mountain, let's say. You walk up to that stream, you look down into the water, what are you gonna see? Most of the time that you look at a stream, you see rocks. How did the rocks get there? Do rocks have some sort of weird magnetic property that attracts water? It's a joke, it's, it's a stupid question. Obviously, if you think about what happens, you get a big rainstorm, right? And gradually, the rain erodes the soil. There's rocks in the soil. Eventually, you get enough of a rainstorm that the rocks pop out of the soil and they roll with the current of the water as it flows to the lowest point. The rocks roll 
into the bottom of the stream. And that's why they end up in that position that they're in. So you see where I'm going with this? You see that what I'm telling you is that the same thing happens in the DNA molecule, such as in that seed that was destroyed with radioactivity. You roll the particles that got killed and moved to the wrong position. They roll back to where they belong, and they roll back together to make DNA because the gravity of the wave is there. Now, if you beamed in light from some other type of species, if it had nothing to do with the seed, then this wouldn't work. What's happening is that each type of life form has its own specific code, and that code can be digitally stored into a photon. That's a new piece of science, you see. This is not the science you heard in school. It only works because you have that specific type of light. But even when you have a plant that already has been destroyed and you don't beam it with any light at all, interesting things will happen. Check out this next slide. We're going to slide in. Boom, there we go. What we got here is the most common plant that we see in the laboratory research experiments that are done on vegetation. This is a mustard weed called Arabidopsis. It's been studied by hundreds and hundreds of scientists going back for decades. What we're looking at here is a very common experiment that is done on this mustard plant. If you look at the top and you notice these blossoms here, you'll see the flowers. This is a typical mustard flower. That doesn't look right, does it? There's something wrong here. Well, that's a mutation. These shouldn't happen. These holes don't belong there. That's really messed up, whereas down here, this is a healthy mustard weed. This is a healthy Arabidopsis plant, as opposed to unhealthy. Now, they do this, they make these mutations, and what was found over 25 years of research was that these lab-induced abnormalities spontaneously healed themselves approximately 15% of the time. There was a spontaneous genetic repair that fixed the DNA. Now, what am I saying? If you have that mutation, you can start that mutation from a single cell. You can clone one cell. That cell never had the DNA information to make it not mutated. The code was taken away from the very first cell. You have a whole plant that grows to adulthood. It doesn't have the DNA information in conventional biology. It should never be able to heal itself. And yet, over 25 years of time, 15% of all the laboratory plants spontaneously healed. What do you think this means for a company like Monsanto? You know what I'm talking about, Terminator seeds, right? Really dodgy stuff here. They are trying to make seeds that will never be able to reproduce so that they can control the food supply, and if you don't pay them, then we starve. But what we find out is that nature will always find a way. It's impossible to stop this from happening. And the reason is that mustard weed is around you right now. You have the information around you in the air right now that makes mustard weed, that makes crustaceans, that makes snails, that makes the blue whale, that makes tigers, bears, pine trees, birds. The information that makes everything on Earth is around us right now. In my book, Source Field Investigations, I show very intriguing scientific research that shows that all of the different types of species on Earth are very similar to each other in terms of the DNA code. You only have to alter it a little bit. The difference between human and dolphin is very small. Even the difference between humans and dogs and rats and mice and monkeys, it's very, very close. So it's the same basic wave with subtle alterations that's causing this to happen, causing different species to occur. But I want to take you further down the rabbit hole, or maybe let's say the rat hole, <laughs> of healing 
when we talk about Gary Iov's research with the rat pancreas, the rat, I'm not going to laugh on camera because that would be very unprofessional and I'm not going to do that. But let's take these rats and let's do nasty things to them because that's what you got to do with science. You can't be kind. You got to throw ethics out the window here. So what are we going to do? We're going to poison these rats. We're going to make sure that under normal circumstances they would die of diabetes. And when you die of diabetes, you lose your pancreas. The toxin that they use to do this is alloxan. It's been done in Moscow in 2000, Toronto in 2001, Nizhny Novgorod in Russia in 2005. The control group of rats, the ones that don't get any special energetic treatments, develop diabetes and they die within four to six days. That's normal. Their blood sugar goes through the roof and their body cannot regulate the blood sugar because they don't have the insulin. Your pancreas is necessary to make insulin, right? You with me so far? The second group is given an identical dose of the same toxin. And based on everything I've been telling you, what do you think is the missing variable here for the treatment? The missing variable is that the pancreas and spleen are surgically removed from a rat that's still alive and healthy, because that's what this rat is missing now. He beams a laser through the spleen and pancreas, and he redirects that light into the rat that had the missing pancreas. The pancreas is not even there. If you autopsy that rat, there's no pancreas. The blood sugar level normalizes and the pancreas completely regrows out of the existing cells in the body. Even though technically, if there's no pancreas, there's no pancreatic DNA, there's nothing to grow. There's no pancreas there. Even though maybe the DNA molecule should have the instructions for the pancreas, we're not used to the idea of organs regrowing in the body. If you're missing an organ, you've got to get an organ transplant. This is the equivalent of an organ transplant, but this healing light could travel up to 20 kilometers, and you still regrow the pancreas. It only required the code, and then existing stem cells and cells that just float through your bloodstream will actually be retooled, and they'll grow together and make a pancreas, and it only takes a little over a week. So think about the fact that rats and humans are very similar and ask yourself, are we making use of the best that medical technology has to us to offer today? Not even close. The field of energy medicine is going to completely revolutionize the world. What we're seeing here is 15 different rats that are color coded. Here's rat number one, here's rat number 15. This is the number of days, this is day number one. They're all given the same toxin here, and then we wait until their blood glucose level is up to a 34, which is normally what would kill them. This is the moment that they're about to die on day four. With four to six days, that's where they all would die. He didn't even start giving them the treatment until day four. Now, notice what happens here. Some of the rats do die, but the majority of them don't. They stabilize. Their blood sugar doesn't get any worse. We're going down here, day four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then suddenly, at about day 10 or day 11, boom, look at this. The blood sugar is dropping, and it drops and drops until by day 11, it's actually gone all the way down. Day 12, they've all normalized. All the survivors, which is over half of all those rats, have survived. And when you later look at them, either with an MRI or a CAT scan, or maybe they autopsied them, which is not a really nice way to reward them for surviving, but they have a pancreas. It's fully restored. It only takes eight days. And don't forget what I talked about in the previous episode with Budakovsky. He took a holographic picture of a raspberry plant, and he beamed the holographic light into a raspberry tumor that we see here. And lo and behold, the tumor becomes a stem cell seed that grows into a healthy raspberry plant, showing no evidence of ever having been cancer. So this completely changes what we would think about a tumor. You don't necessarily have to eliminate the tumor. It's just cells that need to be repositioned in the body. That's huge. Now, before we end the show, I want to talk a little bit more about something that has huge implications for health and consciousness. I want to talk about 
Burlakov's experiment with fish eggs. This is an egg that's mostly developed. You can see the head of the fish coming out. Other eggs might be much less developed where there's only a little germ spot in there and you don't see any fish growing yet. What Burlakov did is he takes these fish eggs and he brings them into contact with each other so light can pass between them. And some of the eggs are brought together when one is slightly younger and one is slightly older. In other experiments, you take an old egg where the fish head is already popping out and the tail just hasn't grown yet, and then you take another one that's very young. Now, what do you think starts to happen as these eggs are brought closer together? Well, in normal science, nothing should happen. But he actually found out that there was a healing effect. A slightly younger egg brought next to a slightly older effect egg will have its healing rate speed up. It actually goes and catches up with the older eggs. But here's the really crazy part. If one set of embryos are significantly older than the others, the younger embryos have a massive health. Their health is stolen from them. They are robbed of their vitality. They lose vital energy. They gain birth defects, and they will die off. They literally shrivel up. So think about what I'm saying here. The core of health, the core of your vitality, is the photons that are stored in your DNA. When your body is sick, the area that is sick will have a reduction in photons. And what we're seeing with Burlakov's fish egg experiment is that those health effects directly are a factor of the photons, and you can have your photons absorbed. Now here's a room where you got older eggs and younger eggs, and the older eggs have this gravitational field that's pulling the health, robbing the health right out of those weaker eggs. But, now this is what's really important, this is the wisdom teaching for this week. If he put a piece of glass in the way, the glass blocks the light from going through and being absorbed by the stronger eggs. So the stronger eggs are still raking out photons from the weaker eggs here, but the photons are banging against this wall and they never make it through, so then they just zing back into another egg. They don't get weak, they don't lose their vitality. You have the capability to protect yourself from people trying to take your quote-unquote energy. This suggests that life and growth is due to a field of energy, that it can be transferred from one person to another. In nature, the mother fish are very careful to lay their eggs in separate locations, and the field will correct for birth defects. Burlikov was able to create mirrors that jiggled the light going into the eggs, and when he did that, they started to mutate. They grow two heads, a funny fin where it doesn't belong. If you take that light and, and heal it, the actual mutations go away as the fish keeps growing. Very, very interesting. So younger embryos will actually gain in health if they're close to the older eggs, but if they're too young, they die off because the older eggs absorb their energy. Now, if you're thinking what I'm thinking, energy vampire, right? People that try to steal your energy. What happens when somebody comes at you with anger and with shame? You crunch in, right? You, you get that posture change. It's as if, remember, you have 92 trillion DNA molecules, or 920 trillion DNA molecules in your body, at least, each one of which has 1,000 photons. Think about how much of your energy someone could potentially be absorbing by getting angry or aggressive. Think about the fact that the glass can protect those eggs. Now, what is the equivalent of the glass? I'm going to argue, based on the meditation effect that we had in a few episodes back, that the positive attitude changes everything. If 7,000 if 7, people meditating can reduce global terrorism by 72%, then when you go into a state of meditation, you're up-leveling your frequency that protects your DNA from losing its photons. So if somebody comes after you in your life and they're trying to humiliate you and attack you, you don't need to have a weak response. You don't need to over-apologize. You don't need to feel scared or afraid. You can lovingly acknowledge where you've done something wrong. You can respect the person, but you don't need to bleed out your energy by feeling as if you've been crushed, by feeling humiliated, by feeling terrified. You can lovingly be accountable but keep your frequency high, keep happy, keep your energy up. And in so doing, you won't be losing your vitality to others. 
That's your wisdom teaching for this week. I'm David Wilcock. This is Gaim TV. Wisdom Teachings with David Wilcock. We'll see you back here next Monday. Thanks a lot. This is David Wilcock. This is the Wisdom Teachings program here on Gaim TV, a vast repository of metaphysical, spiritual, yoga, health, and fitness knowledge in the form of videos, many thousands of them, that you can access every month for $9.99. In addition, you can send me an email, and if we pick your question, we'll have you submit a video to us, and you will be in this show. We're doing six episodes to get started so that there's something for you to watch. And in these six episodes, I'm spelling out the living universe. The show is going to branch off from here into the questions about philosophy and practical tips that you can use to improve your life every day. This is a vast subject. One of the things that I really admire is the law of one material. It was allegedly derived from an intuitive source back in 1981 claiming to be millions, if not billions of years more evolved than we are. Many of the things that I'm sharing with you in these first six episodes, in fact, most of them, were found in their core within this law of one material. But what they tell us is that we are fundamentally energetic beings originally, and that energy is not confined to the level of existence that we are right now. You are a master in training. You have a destiny that supersedes reincarnation. We can talk on and on about Dr. Ian Stevenson's research with over 3,000 children from all over the world in which he went and followed up on their stories of having remembered being someone before. Some children insisted on being called a name that was not their name now. One girl from Lebanon remembered the names and interrelationships of 25 different people that she knew in her alleged past life. He wrote it all down. He found that family. They'd never spoken before. These two families had never come in contact. Every single thing the little girl remembered checked out. Do you want to keep reincarnating again and again? I believe that if you're watching these videos, you're focused on spiritual growth, transformation, personal healing, and self-improvement. If that's true, and you know about reincarnation, you know, in fact, that Christianity was teaching reincarnation. There was an oral tradition of secret knowledge from Jesus himself that was from Apostle Peter. Apostle Peter handed it to Clement of Augustine. Clement of Augustine handed it to a man named Origen. Origen wrote that one of Jesus' strongest teachings amongst the, his own disciples was reincarnation. But in 535 AD, the Catholic Church officially declared reincarnation anathema, which means you will be excommunicated. Now, excommunication back in those days means you're thrown out and you're going to die. You either believe in what they teach you or death will result. When we start to see how reincarnation was carefully manicured out of the Bible, we find out that the religions of the world are not so different. Nobody that did these teachings originally expected that they were going to bifurcate off into their own sect that people would argue, well, my God is better than your God. Originally, it was known to everyone, all the great enlightened masters, all the wisdom teachers, that we reincarnate. And now we have the scientific proof. There's even some quotes in the Bible that made it. There is a quote, I believe it's in the book of Mark, where the disciples asked Jesus, who has sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, Jesus should have said, wait a minute, what are you talking about? How could this man have sinned before he was born? 
And how could that sin be responsible for him being blind? Jesus said, no, it was only that the works of God would be man and made manifest in him. Not that he was sinning before, but Jesus didn't say, whoa, 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 hold on. How could he have been sinning before he was born? So look, there's an oral tradition. We know this. We know the Catholic church took it out because they wanted an airtight cosmology that says you have one life to live. You're either going to hell or you're going to heaven. The only way you can go to heaven is pay tax, which back then was paying the church, which is called an indulgence or a tithe. So government has manicured what I call the subconscious Judeo-Christian bias from the Roman Empire that you probably might still be affected by. Many of the people in the Western world, even if they say, oh, I'm an atheist, I'm not Christian. Well, what they're doing is they're thinking based on that bias that has been taught to them over and over again. There's no reincarnation. But again, reincarnation was proven by Dr. Ian Stevenson. And what that suggests is that there is an energetic blueprint to who you are. Dr. Jim Tucker, who is a child and family psychiatrist, actually went back and looked at Dr. Ian Stevenson's reincarnation cases and found that people who claimed to have been someone else before, when the details checked out, guess what? Police forensic face matching software would actually match up their face to who they had been before strongly enough that they could be accused and committed of a crime that they actually committed in their past life. It's that good. Now, how could that be possible? Dr. Jim Tucker, as a child psychiatrist, fully acknowledges the struggle that we have in science because it changes what we think we know. How could your facial features in your human body be energetically configured by what we could call the soul? It suggests that the DNA is not the whole answer. The DNA would only be what you inherit from your mother and father. How could your face carry over into the body that your mother and father gave you. This gets into energetic science. This gets into what I call the source field, the idea that the universe is made of a, of a living consciousness, space, time, energy, matter, and biological life. You have an address in the source field. You have a name that will always be there. Your name will always remain in the universe. Your image, your awareness, you don't die. You just reincarnate from one life to another until you master the lessons of what you're here for. That's what Jesus' teaching was all about. And the Tibetans actually have 160,000 documented cases of people achieving rainbow body. It does say in the Bible that Jesus triumphed over Sheol. Sheol is the word that means the grave. You can conquer the cycle of reincarnation by learning that the universe has an agenda and figuring out what that agenda is. That's what this show is really about. The wisdom teachings are what you need to know to be on your ascension path to transcend reincarnation. Because if it's true that there is a universal blueprint, as I argue in the source field investigations, of what it means to be human, if that human code is written into DNA that's a wave throughout the universe, then what that also means is that what it means to be human could become the energy that makes the DNA. The DNA, the biological aspect of DNA, may not be the end of you. You may have an energetic signature that transcends the need for flesh once you as a soul reach a certain gradient of understanding and awareness. One of the most interesting things that shows us the potential of where this is going is, as I've said in the other five episodes before, the meditation effect. I want to review this one more time. 7,000 people get together, they meditate, and there is a 72% reduction in terrorism, fatalities, all these different types of variables of people suffering. There's also a corresponding increase in the economics. Everybody's happier, people get along, and three out of four people that would have committed a violent crime for some reason choose not to do it. They feel better, they feel happier because of you. We have the ability to influence the world in a positive way just by going within ourselves. That shows that the universe has an agenda. It's almost as if all of us have ascended a little bit. We're all getting a little bit closer to that state where we transcend 
materiality. All the great world teachers were telling us that you need to be more loving. Forgiveness of others, acceptance of others is the key. And again, everything I've been teaching you is leading up to where we can really have fun with this and talk about philosophy, talk about spiritual healing, talk about personal growth, because I don't want to keep this knowledge hidden. I want you, through this show, to have the knowledge that you need today to make your life happier, more successful, so that you are contributing to the solution by being in that blissful state so that you're one of those 7,000 people because you can live your daily life in a meditative state. Now, another thing that I talked about before is the fact that where we are in relationship to the center of the galaxy, this is sidereal time, that's the position of the Earth relative to the galactic center, has a 400% increase effect on your psychic ability. You will actually get so much more psychic when you come into alignment with the center of the galaxy, suggesting that that galactic center has some energetic influence on your life, that it raises your vibration in some way. Now that would require that consciousness and life is due to an energetic field which is attached to your DNA and moves through your DNA but is not limited to the biological form. That's a whole new way of looking at things. I also spoke in previous episodes, I'm tying it all together for you this time, about the DNA phantom effect. The DNA phantom effect is where when DNA is put into a room, it exerts a gravitational field of some kind. That gravitational field absorbs every photon that would normally just ping around the room. The photons of light bend into the DNA molecule. And what's so fascinating is that when Gary Ayev removed the DNA, it was still held in place. All those photons continued spiraling where the DNA had been. This turns regular science completely upside down. We don't know what to do with this. It doesn't make sense. But what does make sense is the idea that that wave creates the DNA. You see, that's where this is going. The wave comes first, and then the DNA forms from that, but there is a phantom of the DNA that remains in the original location. So this is what the DNA looks like as it absorbs all the photons. There's not one dot here. No light has escaped the molecule. This is what the DNA phantom looks like. You've tilted it and zoomed in, and that's where we're seeing every photon is now captured inside the DNA molecule. The implications of this are incredible because the implications are that what it means to be alive is written into the background of space itself. Your thoughts, your consciousness could be like satellite TV signals or radio signals beaming around. Now we want to get into some new stuff. Here is Dr. Luc Montagnier. This guy is a Nobel Prize winning biologist, not a fluffy guy, not a guy working in his backyard blogging on the internet and hoping that he'll have fans on Facebook. This is a guy publishing mainstream scientific papers, getting himself out there, doing the hard work, and winning a Nobel Prize. Now tell that to the skeptics who say, oh, none of this stuff has any scientific proof. When you hear about what this guy discovered, the skeptics' response, we actually saw this in our discussion forum. Some skeptics were saying, David is having a dangerous idea. The dangerous idea that a Nobel Prize winning scientist is actually credible. Sorry, but ripping bong hits in your mom's basement and writing hate on a YouTube video doesn't qualify you to vet out a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Go back home. Don't bother us because we're trying to take this to the next step. What we can do here is see how this guy is able to look at you over the top of his glasses condescendingly. And when you see a scientist who's able to do that, you know he's on the right track. That's the archetype of the librarian, the study hall monitor, the principal at your school. You got to have chops to be able to do that right there. This guy knows what he's doing. Look at all the weird stuff that surrounds him on the shelves here. Test tubes. I mean, he's on it. Okay, now what did he do? Why does it matter? 
This is what the actual mainstream media published. The, the headline says, can our DNA electromagnetically teleport itself? One researcher thinks so. Now, I don't say teleportation is right. That's, mm, they kind of got it wrong here. What we have to do is actually examine the nature of the experiment. What you're going to see in a minute here is that we've got a tube of water that has little pieces of DNA in it. It's hermetically sealed, capped off. We got other tubes that have water with no DNA at all. It's just pure water. Now, here he is at a conference. Here he is with two tubes of water. The experiment is literally that simple. There's no funny stuff. There's no monkey business. You just have two tubes of water. So let's take it from the top here. What was he doing? You got these two hermetically sealed tubes of water, right? That's what we start with. One of the tubes has little pieces of DNA in it. This experiment didn't work too well if there was too much DNA in the water. You could only have a little bit. Only then would you get the result. You then electrify both of these tubes with a 7 hertz electromagnetic field. That's the coil that you saw wrapped around the two tubes. Now what's so interesting about 7 hertz? You might know because that's Schumann resonance, right? 7.83 hertz is the basic heartbeat of the Earth. And that heartbeat determines, apparently, the base frequency that makes us able to live our lives and have health. Because when he pulsed that frequency through the water that had DNA in it, it activated the photons in the DNA. It released them. The electromagnetic energy shot those photons out. They travel through space. They travel into the other tube next door. And the other tube's molecules of water rearrange into DNA. He's actually, this is a Nobel Prize winning scientist finding water molecules, restructuring, and making DNA. This is astonishing stuff because what it shows us is that DNA appears to be a quantum field effect that doesn't require other life forms to have existed there first. The DNA can be spontaneously, alchemically transformed out of ordinary, plain water. Are you getting how exciting this is? Are you getting that a Nobel Prize winning scientist is showing us that life arranges spontaneously out of non-living material? What do you think that means about the nature of the universe? Could it be possible that life is all over the place? This experiment shows you the proof. This wave that caused these little guys of photons to shoot out of the DNA and trigger the water over here, all you got to do is hit the water with the photons. And he did this over and over again. You got to cook it for about 18 hours. It doesn't happen immediately, but 18 hours is all it takes. And then when you look at these guys under the microscope, they now have pieces of DNA floating in there. Well, that takes us to bacteria. Now, the prevailing viewpoint that you were taught in school, the conditioning that you've been given, if you will, the mind control, is that bacteria all must have started from one progenitor in what we call the primordial soup, right? In the beginning, there was the soup. And the soup was just a broth of nutrients that didn't have any real biological life. And then kapoor, lightning strikes the soup. And they magically come together and they form little microbes. And then from, from that one moment of creation in the atheist viewpoint, all of life on Earth was built. One explosion. Mm, I don't know. There's some problems with that. And here's the problem. Bacteria can be found in the ice in the Antarctic. Bacteria have been found inside volcanoes that actually eat lava. Bacteria have been found inside hermetically sealed nuclear reactors. Nothing is supposed to be able to get in, and these little critters appear on the wall, and they're eating radiation. How the heck did they get in there? They, they survive in space. Now, I'm telling you that if you look at the water experiment that we just had, we see that they're appearing out of non-living material. So for example, in the volcano, the elements in the lava 
actually transform into microbes. Even at that high temperature, the same thing with a nuclear reactor. They're taking the radiation, and the radiation, because it's made of living stuff, everything in the universe is alive, energy, matter, it's alive. The photons have to be right. That's the law of one model. This material that was allegedly channeled in 1981 said that there are second density photons, which mean that they have the codes for all life, which is everything on Earth that's alive is second density except humans, which are third density. First density is Earth, air, fire, and water. Second density photons, the law of one model says, beam in and transfigure first density material like the water molecules into life forms. And that's now been verified by a Nobel Prize winning scientist. How the heck did they know that in 1981? I live with Carla Ruckert, who spoke these words for two years. There's no way that she faked this material. And there's hundreds of points like this in the law of one that can be validated scientifically. So bacteria have been recovered from the ice in the Antarctic. They've been revived after 10 million years of being frozen. That's because the code is there, and then the life wave reanimates the bacteria. We see that there are bacteria that photosynthesize light out of the darkness. We see that they can thrive on infrared, which is heat. And they've been found miles beneath the ocean floor. Everywhere on Earth that we have ever looked, we find life. How could it all possibly have come from one single bacterium that was formed when lightning struck on one place on Earth? It doesn't make sense. You have to open your mind here. And it gets even farther than that. One of the two guys who actually discovered DNA, Dr. Francis Crick, figured out that it's impossible for DNA to evolve randomly. Now, this is not just any old guy. He's one of the two people who discovered the DNA. He knows what he's talking about. Now, here's what he found. DNA is so complicated that it could not evolve randomly. The likelihood would be the, akin to cutting up the Encyclopedia Britannica into individual words, dropping them one at a time like confetti out of a helicopter, and having all the words arranged when they hit the ground into the encyclopedia in its proper sequence. That's how ridiculous it is. It is so astronomical that the whole idea of monkeys on typewriters and one of them is going to type Shakespeare, it even puts that to shame. That probability is good compared to the likelihood that DNA could have ever evolved by a Darwinian random process. It's not there. That's an intelligent cosmos. That's a living universe that has the laws of life written into quantum physics. Biology is made from the wave. That's where it starts. Now, we also have Dr. Fred Hoyle and Dr. Chandra Wickrama Singh, who looked at the dust in the galaxy. And they found that the dust had a very strange optical quality. The only way that they could duplicate that in the lab was by presuming that all the dust in the galaxy was hard on the outside and hollow on the inside, specifically 70% hollow on the inside. Mm, that's weird. 70% hollow on the inside? What could do that? They spent years trying to figure out what could possibly be causing all these particles of dust in the galaxy to be 70% hollow on the inside. One day, they figured it out. If you take bacteria and you freeze dry them, the outside becomes hard and then the whole inside goes hollow, 70% hollow, exactly the same. And this was only one of several optical qualities of galactic dust that are precisely matched by freeze dried microbes. Now, How much of the galactic dust is like this? Believe it or not, it's 99.9% .9 of all the dust in the galaxy. That means that 0.01% doesn't look like dust. Where is all this dust coming from? Think about it for a minute. The solar wind. The sun is giving off particles which then hit our Earth's atmosphere and actually can some cases cause problems. If a lot of particles come in, then we get radio interference. Now we're finding out that the solar wind, the actual stuff that's coming off the surface of the sun, is microbes. That means that when you look at the surface of the sun, you're looking at a boiling, living factory, a factory that makes life. 
then you can say, well, okay, maybe that's the purpose of the sun is just to make microbes. But there's microbes on your skin, aren't there? Do the microbes on your skin represent who you are? No. So maybe the microbes coming off of these stars all throughout our galaxy are only one of the lower forms of life that those stars represent. Maybe those stars have all the codes for all forms of life. Well, that would totally explain what we see with the Budakovsky experiment that I spoke of in one of the previous episodes, two of them actually, in which you beam in a hologram of a healthy raspberry plant into this callus, this tumor, and it generates healthy raspberries. How the heck is that possible? The holographic light carries the code of the DNA molecule, which rearranges the cancer cells and turns them into healthy cells. We also spoke about Burlakov's fish egg experiment, in which older eggs like this were put next to younger eggs, and they absorbed the health out of the younger eggs. I also told you that when he put a glass slide in the way, that that gravitational effect that pulls these photons of health out of those younger eggs was blocked. That glass, what's the, what's the optical property of glass that makes that happen? Do you know? Glass blocks ultraviolet. Quartz does not. If you put a quartz slide in the way, the weaker eggs still die off. But if you put glass in the way, they're protected. The glass is stopping them from losing those ultraviolet photons that are stored in their DNA. That's the essence of health. Now, I want to take it a step further. This is Dr. Glenn Ryan. And no, that's not a mugshot. It's one of the only pictures of him I could find on the internet. This is back when his hair was still black. He's got a more sandy gray color now. But Dr. Glenn Ryan has discovered one of the most significant things in the history of science. He takes undifferentiated human cells from a placenta, sticks them in a test tube, and then hands them to someone who can create really powerful feelings of love or, in other cases, really powerful feelings of anger. When someone sent anger into cells from a placenta, the cells actually die. And he could measure this by their absorption of 260 nanometer ultraviolet light. The amount of that light can be precisely measured, and when you send anger towards those cells, we know that you're killing them. This is microbiological proof that anger kills cells from someone else's body, not your body, somebody else. So he caught this mechanism in process on the quantum level. But when you feel love, you can actually heal someone else's DNA. You're able to restructure it. So you see what this means? You have the power to create DNA structuring waves. That's one of our big wisdom teachings. You are not immune from the healing power of the universe. You can direct it to yourself, you can direct it to other people, and I've now showed you how that works. This is direct DNA evidence supporting the Burlakov fish egg study. It demonstrates that we can transfer vital energy to each other. If you want someone to be healed, you can heal them. And when people get angry, when someone tries to come after you, they want to break you down. As you feel fear, anger, depression, sadness, if you feel like you have to apologize profusely and this person who's so angry refuses to accept an apology and they keep coming after you even after you say you're sorry, you can withdraw. You don't have to take that anger in because they can actually suck the health right out of you. You can be killed off. You can actually get sick from somebody else. And now here's the trick. They feed off of your energy. If you get angry at somebody else, you actually feel more energized. You actually feel more health. Some people have closed down the love in their lives. The love is what opens up that DNA to the photons streaming in from the source field. Because there's virtual photons in the source field. You can take an empty vacuum that has no light and look on the quantum level and little photons appear. When you feel love, you're opening up that DNA phantom. You're opening up that wave so photons can absorb into your DNA. And again, you have so much DNA in your body, we're talking about quadrillions of photons here. So here's the thing. This may be a genetic holdover from the animal kingdom for a very good reason. The survival of the fittest, the more aggressive species succeeds, and specifically the alpha male who's out there at the front of the cave fighting off the saber-toothed tiger, everybody else is cowered in fear, worried about what's going to happen, and they're sending photons to him which make him stronger. 
and he's feeding on that energy. This is what the negative elite in the world are actually doing. This is also why basketball teams or baseball teams or whatever are more likely to win at the home game. So it's a holdover from the animal kingdom. This is what I believe is the root of the negative power elite on earth, what they're trying to do. They're absorbing your energy. They want to create fake catastrophes, put you in fear, terrorize the people, and then be seen as the liberators and the leaders. They put their faces on the coins. Every time you see their face and you're in fear and you're worried about the country, you're sending them energy every time you see them on TV or see them in the newspaper or see them on the cover of a magazine or on the Internet. You're sending photons to them. These tunnels are not restricted by distance. So what you can do today is to help break that cycle. Remember, the meditation effect shows terrorism, war, fatalities, 72% can be reduced. Because when you feel loving energy, when you breathe in that meditative state, do it with me right now, you are healing yourself, you're healing the world. You are pumping the photons back into your DNA, you're healing other people's DNA, you're closing up the wounds that will allow their energy to be stolen from them, and when enough of us do this, we break the cycle of war, atrocities, and fear and pain. That's today's wisdom teaching. I'm David Wilcock. This is Guy TV. Thank you for watching.